And we're back. The last part of our story ended in 2020, with Birds of Prey arriving in theater and the Arrowverse Crisis on Infinite Earths big surprise Ezra Miller Flash crossover cameo seeming to signal that something was coming to reshape the future of the DC Extended Universe. Unfortunately, something turned out to be much bigger than a garbage fire movie franchise, and the reshaping turned out to be global. The COVID-19 pandemic was subsequently shutting down and blowing up everything for the next two and a half years, depending on who you ask, and whatever plans anyone might have been making got unmade. What did they? As I observed last time, when everything from movie releases to movie making ground to a screeching plague-induced halt in 2022, the situation at Warner Brothers concerned the so-called DCEU was as follows. The continuum of the Zack Snyder Justice League movies vis-a-vis -vis the nightmare, I'm too soon, possible future scenario was cancelled, called off, going nowhere, Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck were both out, and if we ever saw them again, it'd be as cameos and something else maybe to write them out permanently. The studio was pivoting to different types of projects to diversify their brand and several different senses and they were going to officially reboot whatever still passed for continuity using the pretext of a Flash movie. And now in 2023, that's basically still where we are, just with a different set of hands currently on the wheel, hopefully with a lot more stability. So what you're about to watch unfold here is coverage less of a studio and media franchise devolving or falling apart like last time and more like a frantic, flailing, falling apart in slow motion along with the rest of the world. Because yeah, all of this tragicomic nonsense was happening at Warner Brothers in DC, but also a real world horror show was unfolding all around us in reality, which made it all feel just slightly smaller and even more pointless than it already did. So with that in mind, we're starting off with four episodes that do not jump right into the movie news because there wasn't any for a bit, instead focusing on related adjacent stories from the world of film, comic, and pop culture fandom, which I believe help if not paint a picture, at least set the stage for what was about to happen going forward. The implosion of the DC 5G project in comics, fandom tantrums about Gotham High and Joker, and what happened when COVID shut down Comic-Con for the first time in 50 years. All right, busy this week, didn't need breaking news, voice is still a little sore, but okay, that's the life. So, Dan Didio, who's been the chief editor at DC Comics for an impressively long period of time, not in the sarcastic sense, like he wasn't actually there for long, but nobody was anywhere long anymore, like he actually had this job for the length of time that people used to have jobs for back when there actually were jobs. Like, this man had a career in publishing. Those words actually used to go together. Seriously, I was there. I saw it. And water still tasted like water. And the president wasn't a criminal. And we had these things called bees. I swear. Ahem. <clears throat> Yeah, Dan Didio ran the show at DC for a long-ass time, but over the weekend he got fired by the higher-ups, aka Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers' new co-owners, AT&T, and no one's exactly 100% sure why. Maybe they just wanted to shake things up, maybe he did something wrong, maybe the whole thing is very much in flux. All anyone is sure of is that, at least as of this writing, former co-guy in charge, Jim Lee, is now running the whole show, and no one knows what, if anything, is going to change next. Now, normally, the departure publisher wouldn't necessarily be the most earth-shaking news for a comics outfit, to the degree that anything could actually be considered earth-shaking relative to the fact that the comics business is at this point a generally unprofitable write-off for multinationals like AT&T and Disney that develop and maintain marketable IP as loss leaders that can be adapted into movies, TV, and merchandising where the actual money is made, except that Didio himself was a longtime company man and infamous micromanager who exerted a tremendous influence on the densely connected universe of DC publishing. So his abrupt, and if the increasingly uniform industry gossip is to be believed somewhat acrimonious ousting, potentially leaves the second biggest player in the game without a center of gravity, and potentially without a guiding hand for what is meant to be another of its by now customary continuity shakeups. Yes, already. Comics are weird. Okay, I can't re-explain all of these every time because the stack there is starting to get too many and fully digging into Doomsday Clock is going to have to wait for a thing I want to do later about how it's weird but kind of great that we've got two different Watchmen sequels now, but short version. Because comic books have long ongoing stories that audiences love, but the majority of the famous comic book characters were created long enough ago that if time progressed in their world like it does here, they'd all be old and dead by now, comic publishers that want to keep drawing fans with continuity-driven storytelling have to come up with increasingly bizarre devices to make it all make sense that no one gets any older. Marvel, in the comics, not the movies at least so far, has at least since the mid 
1970s use what's referred to as an elastic timeline, whereby it's generally assumed that all comics take place in the immediate present unless otherwise specified, and that in the immediate present it's always been roughly ten years, give or take, since Reed Richards' spaceship returned to Earth, with he and his family having been transformed into the Fantastic Four, thus beginning the Marvel Age of Superheroes. And thus, depending on when you're reading at any given point, any era-specific details just kind of get moved forward in history as best they're able to, and the length of time Steve Rogers was frozen after World War II just gets longer and longer and longer. DC, on the other hand, while also having elastic time to a degree, has a much older and more legally complicated portfolio of copyrighted characters to manage as well, so they prefer to once every four to six years, though lately it's been more like two to three, publish ginormous company-wide months-long crossover event maxi-series referred to as some sort of crisis, where a cosmic supervillain and or apocalyptic existential threat attempts to end all existence, and the only path to victory involves unmaking and remaking reality in a reset to zero, which is meant to make their continuity less complicated for a little while, and has like a sort of 40-60 record of actually accomplishing this. Anyway, the most recent version of that was called Doomsday Clock, which if you're someone who was listening to the last few paragraphs of this grinding your teeth in frustration has the added are you fucking kidding me factor of being a Watchmen sequel. Kids, would you step outside for a second? <gasps> Wait there's more, which canonically connects the world of Alan Moore's landmark deconstructive superhero take to the continuity of the official DC Comics universe. You see, what those bloody corporations do, they take your ideas and they suck them. Suck them like leeches until they've gotten every last drop of the marrow from your bones. I know, I know. Summary for now, this time it was Dr. Manhattan's fault that the continuity was all screwed up and there's a multiverse again, or actually there always was, except when there wasn't, maybe. This is one of the times things did not really make more sense once they'd been explained. In any case, what's relevant about this to our present news item is that apparently Doomsday Clocks, everything happened, but also actually nothing happened, but really it's all happening at once and will again, and by the way, here's a joke about the next crises being a Marvel crossover, because AT&T will probably get mad and sell us to Disney or something eventually, Denouement left so much old stuff new again out in the open, but also up in the air, because it was also setting up the dominoes for, please don't be mad at me, I'm just the messenger, the real second decade of the 21st century timeline reboot crisis rumored to be announced at San Diego Comic-Con this summer and rolling out to stores in October. Yeah! Guys, I don't write this stuff, I just make shows explaining it. Supposedly, again, this is all based on scant early reporting, semi-confirmed leaks, and everybody knows industry scuttle at this point who even really can say. The big idea, well, part of it, was a big, line-wide identity refresh with an eye on diversity in new markets, aka these brands were thought up in the 30s and 40s but were making movies out of them for a global audience in 2020, so give us something to work with, by way of scrapping the mainstream DC Comics timeline of any Marvel-style elasticity. In other words, a new timeline where instead of however many 90 years or so worth of storylines DC currently considers canonical, all having happened in an absurdly compressed amount of time between the mid-80s or so and now, baby Superman's rocket lands on the Kent's farm back in either my parents or grandparents' days, I guess, again, none of this was technically official yet, all of the various DC heroes and their stories play out over decades and decades, and thus in the present, aka right now, 2020, all the major A-plus Justice League level name heroes are either old as hell and retired, or presumably dead, and new people have carried on their positions. In some cases, not necessarily the inheritors people would automatically expect i.e. Superman and Lois Lane's son Jonathan Kent, is supposedly the new Superman, Luke Fox, son of Lucius Fox, also the second adoptee of the Batwing mantle, is Batman, Captain Boomerang's son Owen might be the new Flash, because he's also the son of a woman related to the reverse Flash via time travel, I'm not explaining that, and either Nubia or a descendant thereof may be the new Wonder Woman, or maybe not. And also, presumably a bunch of other new people taking up a bunch of other old names and entirely new ideas and new names that this or that creator wants to take a shot on as well, and because this is a DC publishing initiative, it was slated to be preceded and rolled out concurrently with an escalating series of smaller event scale series retelling the for now official story of when everything happened and how, breaking the official timeline into four eon spanning generations of DC continuity leading into a fifth generation or DC 5G or G5 or Gen 5 or Generation 5, no one seems to have settled yet, as the cool new young people in famous capes main DC universe. Now obviously whether you're for or against the idea of taking a United Colors of Benetton pass at the DCEUA list or not, everybody knows this kind of thing is always temporary, as was the case 
case, when Marvel took a similar tack with the all-new, all-different, and Marvel Now initiative a few years ago, it was nakedly obvious they were running market research for future cinematic universe characters and concepts, and this is so clearly that the Doomsday Clock even has Dr. Manhattan foretell a 2026 end date for whatever the 5G universe is going to be. In fact, it's widely expected that DC is going to keep right on publishing the original, aka current traditional timeline continuity and characters in a separate DC Black Label line, which is currently a larger format, higher page count offshoot used mainly for mature audience and prestige reprint books, but growing exponentially by the day. So it's entirely plausible that for a certain amount of time there would be at least two official DC Universe lines being sold side by side, or at least that might have been the plan at one point. Because again, as far as anyone outside the need to know meetings at AT&T and Warner Brothers offices knows, DC 5G was Dan DiDio's baby, and now he's not there, possibly in part or in whole because of plans including this. No one can say though. Officially, things are proceeding as they were planned, but the tone of the business is not suggesting order and stability. It's also not suggesting not order and stability, so no one is talking. Please disperse! Nothing to see here, please! Which, I'm aware, is somewhat ironic given that we're talking about a company that consecutively published books titled Infinite Crisis and Final Crisis, both of which somehow were dishonestly named. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. So, how are you spending the age of social distancing and, depending on where you live, self-quarantine? Have we all written the great American novel, caught up with every show we swore we were finally going to watch, and or shredded our physiques into that Marvel movie real-life super soldier serum shape? Or are we stuck pondering the existential dread that got us to this sad point? Well, even if you're not making what you feel would be the best of this unasked-for staycation, at least you can be glad if you're not the sad folk who've decided to spend it still being somehow angry at a Saturday Night Live sketch from almost two months ago, specifically this bit about the then-upcoming Academy Awards from comedian Melissa Villasenor, in which she identified a common theme in several of the highest-profile nominees. Remember this? Joaquin Phoenix, skinny, skinny, laughs a lot, but still so scary. Dances on steps, goes stompy, stompy, puts a pillow over crazy mommy. But the thing that this movie is really about is white male rage, white male rage. Gee, I wonder if that film's respective fan base is still having a tantrum about it months later. Now, honestly, I really don't think there's anything new or deeply interesting left to be said about Joker, at least not by me. I said my piece, a lot of people liked it, I didn't. I found it shallow, scattered, overly self-satisfied, and far too content to treat looking like other movies that had points for having a point of its own. But since fair is fair and one needs to at least try to engage with an argument sincerely, even if you strongly suspect that it's coming from a place of ignorance, bad faith, or both, before dismantling it for the entertainment of one's audience, if one separates as best one is able the wheat from the chaff of the various backlashes to this single joke topical skit, the prevailing sincere argument that emerges that it's unfair and dismissive to characterize Joker in this way because the film was not only, in its defender's opinion, not about white male rage. I gotta say, I, I don't remember that song in Joker, and, uh, and I watch that movie every day while I work out. <laughs> but in fact was about a host of other more positive things, such as class struggle, wealth inequality, child abuse, mental illness, the breakdown of civility in the age of mass media, and most importantly of all, further leveraging the market value and media footprint of intellectual property related to DC Comics publishing subsidiary of the AT&T Time Warner Corporation. Furthermore, even if the film is narratively driven by the rage of a character who is white and male, why focus on that specific aspect when said rage isn't based in those aspects of his identity, but rather, well, a grab bag of topical buzzwords, convoluted Elseworlds red herring mystery about Thomas Wayne, and references to two different Martin Scorsese movies, basically, at least as far as the plot of the film is concerned. To which I would respond, well, partly it's because, thanks in no small part to some attention-seeking commentary from the film's director, Joker had already become something of a conversation piece on that front beforehand, and thus getting in on the other side of that nonsense was a surefire way for the sketch to go viral, which is what all weekend update segments are essentially aiming to do in this era of SNL. But also because the sketch wasn't, at least from where I was sitting, only or even primarily about Joker or The Irishman, which was the other film that gets the full song bit before the wrap-up medley. This movie has a lot to offer Al Pacino as Jimmy Hoffa Gangster life gets kinda messy Robert De Niro and Lil Joe Pesci It's three hours long, they're old and they're young And it's white male rage, white male rage, white male rage Irishman! <laughs> 
it was about the Oscars as a whole, and a general theme of what not only these nominated films, but also the nominated films in general, popular media beyond the nominees, and the cultural moment of 2019 that produced them all seem to have in common, at least from Villasenor's perspective, and in what was likely presumed to be the prevailing perspective of the sketch's audience. Remember, Weekend Update has not been about general punchlines in the form of headlines, as it was in the Chevy Chase or Kevin Nealon days for about two decades now. It was SNL's answer to The Daily Show, meaning that its humor is targeted mainly at viewers in the show's broader Gen X and older millennial main audience that follow daily political news habitually, and what that audience was likely to already know about the impending Oscars was its controversy already erupting in the form of widespread condemnation of high-profile snubs of widely expected nominees like Eddie Murphy, Jennifer Lopez, Aquafina, Greta Gerwig, Lupita Nyong'o, and others along with many of their respective projects, leaning many industry pundits to posit that this overriding, if not precisely total, whiteness, maleness, and inarguable traditionalism of the selections might at least be in part the manifestation of a backlash by the older, less diverse establishment guard of the Academy voters against recent status quo shakeups within the business, like the successful push to diversify the Academy ranks themselves two years ago, changes to the nominating process which allowed a wider variety of films and genres to qualify for Best Picture, public activism for diversity in filmmaking journalism by celebrities like Ava DuVernay, Brie Larson, and Patricia Harkett, and of course the Me Too movement having brought down multiple once powerful figures like Harvey Weinstein and made other less than savory industry power players feel accountable for the first time ever. In other words, it's arguable that the context of the moment subtext to the sketch for the audience of the moment was that the reason these films and performances found favor with the Academy voters while other perhaps less conventional choices were overlooked was that they were the most suited to being cathartic vessels for the white male rage of said traditional old school Academy members. Manson, Hitler, white male rage, World War One cause of white male rage, little women, big performances, but Greta Gerwig some cause of white male rage. Or for those of you whose eyes have glazed over because this stopped being only about the goddamn clown movie for a minute, the complaint isn't that Joker is about an angry white guy, it's that Joker isn't very original. That having been said, there is another more substantive, theoretically at least, criticism being raised here. Sort of. In some of the more lucid, less agenda-driven contrarian commentary on the matter, or rather agenda-driven but maybe by an agenda more meaningful than leave my gritty clown movie alone, is the opinion that movies like Joker are expressing an anger and frustration that's rooted in a genuine, if crudely stated, reality of real-world problems. That this and other recent films about explosions of incoherently violent outrage by seemingly ordinary people against society and the system are artistic manifestations of real frustrations and real outrages by real people in the real world about their lives, jobs, futures, inequality, healthcare, debt, psychological well-being, loneliness, fear, all sorts of things and that by overgeneralizing the categorization thereof as simply white male rage, which comes with the potential side effects of implying bigotry and or other ulterior motives on part of the aggrieved, can have unintended or even deliberately insidious consequence of diminishing valid concern by caricaturing the tone and presentation in which it's expressed, i.e. if white male rage is an easy three-word shorthand for the collective frustrations of a section of the impoverished working class and then subsequently becomes a punchline, then said section and their frustration can be brushed aside as unworthy of serious consideration, in this case by a rainbow coalition of quote-unquote Hollywood elite elites, who may themselves be superficially diverse but theoretically unified by shared membership in the upper class. And that phenomenon, the coding of certain types of expression of anger, disagreement, objection, etc., endemic to a culture or class, as somehow innately malevolent or unserious is a real, long-standing problem in the world for a lot of different types of people and has been for a long time. Black American slang terms being associated with street crime a branded profanity without cause, Irish and Italian American regional accents being culturally associated with organized crime in earlier generations, feminine anger overall being branded as hysterical and broadly diminished, certain verbal signifiers common to those who learn English as a second language becoming stereotypical shorthand for lack of education. I hope none of this is new information to anyone, right? We all understand that this happens, and that it's wrong, yes? But the thing is, I'm not 100% sure that it happens here or elsewhere collectively in the same way to white men. This is Lance, our intern. Lance, this is undercover brother. Shit. What can I tell you, man? Affirmative action. What? And I say that as a white man, a very, very white man, a my ancestors were on the Mayflower white man, particularly not to the degree that constitutes a meaningful class-based discrimination, especially in cases concerning representation, such as the subject at hand, because, well, as is the point of the SNL sketch, white male rage as a form of expression is not just not discriminated against in our popular culture, it's celebrated, vindicated, lionized even. I'm a white dude and I'm mad about a thing is the tone, tenor, subject, theme, and aesthetic 
music of hundreds of thousands of popular songs, entire genres of music, in fact, countless beloved books, the entire spectrum of American electoral politics as of this recording, hell, a bunch of episodes of this very show, and more classic films than anyone would know what to do with. In fact, while the idea of upscale corporate Hollywood tastemakers scheming to police discourse about economic hardship and social inequality is a valid thing to be vigilant about, I would offer, on the other hand, that it's equally valid to consider that sad sack lower class white guy lashes out at society and or the system being so reflexively associated with important meaningful narrative in our culture is the only reason that a film as shallow unfocused and lacking originality as Joker got to be as highly regarded as it was for anything outside of its lead performance but then again wherever anyone came down on this what's perhaps most amusingly surreal about the entire quote-unquote controversy is that when it finally came time to hand out these most recent Oscars it turned out that the 2019 movie that really seemed to bowl over the Academy was Parasite, a film that was in fact explicitly about the literal and figurative rage and resentment of the impoverished class against the bourgeoisie breaking through to the surface, but also featured a white male count of approximately zero on either end of that rage because it's a movie from South Korea. Because sometimes, even in this hell world, good old chaos theory will in fact lean in all like, hey now, those are some nice binary narratives you got there. Sure would be a shame if some reality got in the way and f***ed it all up, huh? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. You know, I know we're all going a little stir-crazy, folks, but I gotta tell you, even as I sit here as a professional stuff complainer about her, watching my give-a-shit reserves dwindle down to nil and wondering where exactly my next 30 days worth of billable hours are actually gonna come from, even I'd be hard-pressed to go digging into things I know for a fact I just don't care about to make myself angry, and I'd do I do this for a living! I mean, I can remember a time in my life when my mind worked like that, but I graduated from high school. Which is, for a change, an apt metaphor, because what I'm actually talking about is, of course, that the internet has decided to have an actual cow about something that I wasn't even aware was a thing happening called Gotham High, which apparently is a new alt-timeline DC Comics offering from the Elseworlds department that reinterprets the cast of the Batman mythos. The Batman mythos? Oh, good, I was worried it might be a bunch of characters we were all sick of because they've been done to death. Ahem. <clears throat> That reinterprets the cast of the Batman mythos as a set of Gossip Girl slash Riverdale slash OC, Saved by the Bell, 9021, whatever the current reference is, Gen Z teenagers, in a high school young adult romance style setting primarily framed around a potential love triangle between Selena Kyle, rich kid Bruce Wayne, and working class kid Jack Napier. Roll clip. Welcome to Gotham High, where everyone worships the rich and the beautiful. And no one is richer or more handsome than Bruce Wayne. He doesn't have friends, he has followers. My friend Jack Napier has nothing to his name, except good looks and a wicked sense of humor. The problem is that I love them both. I'm Selena Kyle, that girl next door. And in my opinion, a triangle is a perfect shape. Okay, so high school alt-universe fanfic, but officially sanctioned and obviously aimed at leveraging Batman IP for young teenagers, perhaps cynically so. Clearly not aimed at me, probably not something I'd be likely to read even though I'm a Batman fan, just like how I don't get the Mario and Sonic Olympic games, even though I love Mario and tolerate Sonic. But it doesn't really sound objectionable, just not for me. I mean, sure, there's enough latent, dumb nerd bro reflex residually kicking around my psyche to understand the quick response of, well, that's dumb, or this is disrespectful to the property, but the property is about a wealthy furry who punches clown gangsters, so nah. I mean, it's the same way I felt about Gotham when that first popped on my radar. I heard, well, it's a Batman show, but no Batman because he's like a toddler, and I thought, well, that doesn't sound very interesting, so I didn't bother watching it right off. I'm sure I'll catch up with all of it at some point, other than to troll social media back when with this recut commercial. What's your name? Bruce 
Incidentally, this is actually the third time up to bat for this general Batman goes to high school concept at least, and the second for this same title, a cartoon that was to have been called Gotham High, with more explicitly recognizable versions of the various characters and a comedy vibe was pitched back in the late 2000s and went unmade, though I guess that's also more or less what Superhero Girls is, and Batman Beyond originally happened because Warner Brothers told DC Animation to figure out a way for Batman to go to high school, and they said, well, can it be a different Batman in the future? And they said, sure. Now this obviously is significantly different than Batman Beyond, for one thing, this is an outright rewrite of the all-important canon, but it's also an Elseworlds alternate continuity story which DC has a long and storied tradition of, particularly with Batman. Hell, one of the most popular things they're publishing now is a set of recurring miniseries called White Knight, where psychiatric medication turns the Joker into a good guy who discovers Batman as an unwitting pawn in a capitalist conspiracy of the 1%. Somehow that's okay, though. Now, of course, so far, since this Gotham High business is literally brand new, a lot of the sight unseen criticism is being aimed at more superficial changes, like that Bruce is now part Asian and Martha Wayne Why did you say that name? is an heiress from Hong Kong and the source of the family fortune, which apparently diminishes the character of Thomas Wayne somehow. I mean, okay, if you say so, but why did so many of the same voices so mad about Thomas marrying money instead of being born to it? Seriously, what is the big deal there? Not get mad, and in fact seem to very much enjoy the recent Joker movie, where the whole plot hinged on that continuity's Thomas Wayne being a huge callous asshole and Joker just being some guy who goes berserk in part because he thought Wayne was his deadbeat dad. I mean, why is that okay, and White Knight is okay, and all the other alternate universe Batman shit was okay, but this one's going too far? He said as if there was any doubt. Now look, this is already more time than I probably needed to devote to this, but for real, the amount of effort expended on stuff you don't need to acknowledge just baffles me sometimes, people. This episode is likely the beginning and end end of my taking note of Gotham High as a concept because I don't really want or need to care all that much about a Batman spinoff for teenage girls. What's confusing to me is, why do you? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. As many people were expecting, the spate of closures, cancellations, delays, and things to look forward to that are just not happening anymore, brought about by the combination of a global viral pandemic and a large, difficult to centrally manage nation being overseen by the dumbest human beings available to do that job, has now claimed another victim in the form of San Diego Comic Con, which has been cancelled for the first time in 50 years, an unprecedented, if again not exactly unexpected turn of events for the yearly pop culture showcase that has gone from being one of the more decent sized trade show slash fandom gatherings for a niche industry to something like the yearly de facto nexus point for almost all popular entertainment in the United States. Now, this right here is the part that's generally going to show up at the end of a lot of videos and articles about this subject, but I'm putting it up front because I want you to actually hear it. Losing Comic-Con this year sucks for fans who go for the party and for people like me who go for work, but also because we want to see friends and colleagues that we otherwise don't see all year. And because there won't be the usual big, cool, blowout reveal showcases for Marvel and Warner Brothers and whoever, and there won't be exclusive merch if you're into that, you know, yeah, that sucks. But who it really sucks for is for the people for whom this and other big conventions like this are their whole income. Independent artists, smaller dealers and resellers, cosplay performers, merchants, all of that. This is a gigantic and in some cases devastating financial hit to a lot of those people. So please... Please, even if you're not someone who was going to the convention and thus now has some extra money kicking about, look online, look on social media, look at people's Patreons, Instagram, Facebook, all of that, because the folks who've been hit hard by this will be reaching out looking to make sales and get paid through other means, and they could really use your support. This is going to kick the shit out of a lot of people's bottom line. They could use the help, for real. Anyway, while at least still nominally about the comic book industry in terms of its professional panels and overall floor space, ever since the superhero genre became the biggest genre on the planet and the Marvel Cinematic universe evolved that into a multi-genre cross-pollination machine that helped transform itself and parent company Walt Disney into the dominant pop culture force of the 21st century, San Diego Comic-Con, or SDCC, has become the destination point where the worlds of Hollywood business, entertainment journalism, and fandom culture intersect most directly out of the whole year. Sure, it was always a place where the big trailers got shown off before anywhere else, especially for sci-fi movies. In fact, back in the day, when it was a much smaller venue than it is now, it was one of the first places where the canny early marketers for a then-little-known gamble of a production out of 20th Century Fox called Star Wars got significantly teased around for the in-the-know hardcore fanboy set back in 1977, but ever since the trailer for Iron Man got an unexpectedly rapturous reception from Hall H crowds back when the Marvel Cinematic Universe was still just a weird, independent, mid-budget, tie-in IP licensing project that Paramount was backing and then went on to be a gargantuan hit and kickstart the biggest hit machine ever, it's become bigger and more complex than just
just showing off product. After all, you can just release trailers online. Instead, the Hollywood Comic Con, specifically the giant exclusive showcases in Hall H, typically dominated by Disney, Warner Brothers, and other big studios, showing off their upcoming slate of genre entertainment, is now the fuel injection and ignition point for a 21st century engine of self-sustaining content production and mass marketing, where not only the films themselves, but their interconnected narrative tendrils, semi-participatory audience anticipation, guessing game, fan theory, speculation, and drip feed of official and unofficial infotainment, are all part of a meta-narrative ripple effect that emanates out from each yearly SDCC information download. Projects and plans are announced, knowns and unknowns are teased, questions are answered, and new ones raised, reporters scramble to get the world out, and literal years worth of parsing and conjecture gets generated, which, not uncoincidentally, often provides the corporations in charge of this with a steady stream of usable feedback, at actual algorithmic feedback, not comments or takedown videos. Nobody who matters is listening to those or cares what they say as to what's working for them and what's not. And this year, they don't get that. And that's just the start of it. Well, we were still a ways out from the point when we would have actually known who was supposed to show off what at the now-canceled event. By default, the big-ticket showcases are generally Marvel Studios and Warner Brothers slash DCEU presentations on the film side. Marvel typically having had a big MCU movie just open a few months ago in May that probably teased some plot development or whole other film they can reveal more about here, while also hyping up the rest of the slate and making some new reveals and often at least one big movie coming up in the fall to really hype. Warner Brothers typically having several major blockbusters currently or soon hitting throughout the summer and fall to celebrate and hype for next year, along with, well, whatever the plan is for the ever-evolving DC Universe movies. Yes, to be sure, there's also typically something from Star Wars, Star Trek, and all of the other properties to get showcases as well, but many of those have their own dedicated conventions to think of as well. See also why Disney holds off its animated fair for the D23 Expo. The big two superhero universes, those still generally live at SDCC. But, well, both could still theoretically just do big online, televised, or even streaming reveals for whatever their big news was supposed to be this year, well, that's a bit of a problem still. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic blowing up every everyone's plans, this July scheduled showcase would have been unfolding in a timeline where Marvel's Black Widow and Warner Brothers' Wonder Woman 1984 would have both already been released. Since that's no longer the case, and since both films, despite also being set at points in the past, are part of interconnected superhero universe continuities, likely expected to introduce new plot elements for fans to hope become future movies or reveal stuff that's already set to be part of future movies soon to be confirmed, perhaps a few months later at Hall H and Comic-Con, well, that changes what said presentations can present, doesn't it? No one really knows what the future thrust of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is yet, for example, and Black Widow, despite being a prequel, was likely the first opportunity to set some kind of significant momentum in motion in that regard. Now, whatever momentum might be, they can't bring it up yet, and anything in any other trailers or announcements for Eternal, Shang-Chi, Thor, Love and Thunder, the various Disney Plus series, or anything else that might reference plot details that everyone and their grandmother was expected to already know from having watched Black Widow would now carefully need to be talked around as well. This may be equally true for Wonder Woman 84, which was technically done since last year as it was supposed to be out for the holidays, but got pushed and is now pushed further, possibly, depending on who you ask, because of the studio still not being 100% decided on what they're going to do about the present-day state of the other DCEU movies now that they've recast Batman, will almost definitely recast Superman, and have gone through so many directors and writers on The Flash that they might be looking to cut their losses on that one too, and also the actor got caught on camera like choking somebody out maybe, so who knows. You told me Granted, it was already widely known that the Wonder Woman sequel was making a deliberate, near-complete stylistic and tonal break from both its predecessor and the other films in the now-defunct Zack Snyder-era DCEU features, but whether or not it would be taking the opportunity to rewrite the character's own future as effectively a soft reboot has been an open question. If it did, SDCC might have been where Warner Brothers was planning to tell people what that actually means and what it was going to look like going forward, perhaps even announce a future project in casting, show a trailer for the Batman or James Gunn's Suicide Squad 2. That could all be in flux now. And it's not only the superhero material either, as Warner Brothers is concerned. One of the studio's long-term bets for the year had been the animated feature Scoob, a reboot of the Scooby-Doo brand that also incorporated other Hanna-Barbera cartoon characters such as Captain Caveman, the Blue Falcon and Dynamut, Dick Dastardly and Muttley, and at least according to the trailer, multiple other obscurities like Magilla Gorilla and The Impossibles, with the end goal being a launching of a proposed Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. But with U.S. theaters looking unlikely to reopen in a timely fashion, the studio recently opted to send the film direct to streaming and digital in late May, bypassing theaters altogether with no word as to what that might mean for the future of the broader Hanna-Barbera project. Though if the film had been a theatrical hit, it might have been the kind of thing you heard more about at Comic-Con. As I said up front, none of this is exactly what you'd call a huge deal compared to the fact that something like a plague is sweeping the globe, that whatever the infection and recovery rates are or become, people are getting sick and dying, and even survivors are grappling with the loss of stability, security, jobs, loved ones. By comparison, waiting longer for movies, not going to a pop culture convention, one or more giant entertainment companies worth billions of dollars, having to rethink their marketing strategies, not even part of the same experiential universe, but it's another indication, a reminder 
reminder that even as some places are already, perhaps ill-advisedly, perhaps much too early, grappling with the choice of when and how to attempt to return to normalcy, that no matter what, the effects of not normal are going to be with us for a long time and felt for even longer, and we need to be ready for that so that we can deal with it and take care of each other. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Crazy times make people do crazy things, and so it goes for companies. When AT&T bought Warner Brothers, the assumption was that the studio was going to be cranking out big movies and TV series from its massive library of recognizable IP, and that would help make it a major player in the streaming scene, with every media company really, really wanting to be the new frontier for lots of mostly short-sighted reasons, and now saw everyone relying on it via the pandemic as ultimately the opportunity to really, really push hard at that. Over at Disney, this is how you got that gigantic spike in Disney Plus series orders from Marvel and Star Wars, and from Bob Chapek and Kareem Daniel, both now fired from the company that seemed to severely strain the company's relationship with its subsidiaries and post-production partners. At AT&T, it was all about trying to boost up the HBO Max project at the expense of everything else, hoping that the content library would boost the corporate parent's profile in the looming 5G wars with China. One of AT&T's apparent big ideas for the killer app? Give in to the demands that seemed very, very popular on social media trends and spend a bunch of money to actually make the so-called Snyder Cut, i.e. a miniseries length R-rated version of Justice League closer in tone and story to what Zack Snyder's original concept for the movie was using the original footage and a ton of reshoots and new edits that would require a whole new round of spending. Presented here, a pair of episodes reacting to the immediate aftermath of that news from 20. Okay, okay. Quick as we can for those of you who live in the world where you don't have to know this farce has been going on for two and a half years, or perhaps you're like most moviegoers in that you've just been trying really, really hard to forget that anybody actually tried to make DC superhero movies other than Wonder Woman in between the Nolan Batmans and Aquaman, you might recall that Warner Brothers was really, really sure that Zack Snyder's Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice would be a billion dollar smash that either put them on par with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and would be massively embraced by audiences as an elevation of the genre, and instead arrived as a critically panned box office disappointment that audiences mostly received as an instant pop culture punchline Why did you say that, name? that even the studio's own subsequent features are still making fun of. What's your mother's name? Martha. My mommy's name is Martha, too. This made it a bit awkward that the studio had, for some reason, been so competent in the film that they'd already plowed ahead into production on a two-part Justice League follow-up and multiple spin-offs to try and catch up with the Avengers franchise, and course-correcting midstream when you'd already gone all-in with a filmmaker of decidedly singular, all-encompassing auteur affectation like Zack Snyder is kind of a difficult prospect, and also, frankly, a bit of a dick move. I'm a film critic who mostly came to dislike Man of Steel and considers Batman v Superman one of the worst cinematic misfires I've ever witnessed in my life, but the problems with those films do not include a lack of talent or creative drive on the part of that particular filmmaker. Still, whatever did or didn't go down between the reportedly ever-indecisive Warner Brothers and the famously control-oriented director during production, Snyder ultimately did step away from the project to deal with a devastating family tragedy, and the film was completed by a studio editing team and additional directing and reshoots by Joss Whedon, resulting in a version with apparently very different abbreviated storyline, tons of different scenes and story points meant to set up a now likely not happening the same way shared universe, and definitely not happening at all second movie removed, awkward tone shifts from scene to scene, and an oddly truncated yet still overstuffed main plot that was received angrily by fans and indifferently by everyone else, leading perhaps inevitably to a social media movement to coalesce around the hashtag release the Snyder Cut, demanding that the studio would let fans see what the film might have looked like in its original form, coming up almost immediately after it came out. And as you'll be unsurprised to learn, they were not taking that's not how filmmaking works, we can't just do that for an answer. And now, two and a half years later, they don't have to. Wednesday afternoon, during a promoted live chat screening of Man of Steel, Zack Snyder himself made the not unexpected announcement that a project currently titled Zack Snyder's Justice League is in fact being produced for a 2021 debut on the new Time Warner AT&T affiliated streaming service HBO Max. While details are still not 100% set in stone, for example, it's not yet decided whether or not this will be a single long one-off feature or formatted as a miniseries and released as a set of episodes, I would probably bet on the latter one. The basic deal here is that Snyder, his wife and co-producer Deborah, and much of the original production crew, plus whatever a new infusion of 30 million in post-production budget can buy, will be reassembling the footage already shot, completing unfinished effects for unused takes, 
works and effectively producing a whole new version of Justice League closer to what Snyder himself had originally intended, though obviously not exactly that since his original plans already changed significantly during production, there's no incoming future sequels anymore, and also, you know, it's been two and a half years, he's probably got just regular new ideas since then. Which of course makes the told-you-so celebratory antics of some of the online Snyder Cut fanbase a bit on the ironic side. Yes, they're getting a version of what it is they swore they wanted, but the basic stated facts of the director and studio having to make an entire new project out of it, with even Snyder himself calling it a brand new thing, mean that getting it confirms that a key tenet of the Snyder Cut mythology, that some more or less near-complete better version of Justice League was being held hostage in a vault somewhere and needed only to be set free to prove itself, was always a ridiculous fantasy. Zack Snyder's Justice League will evidently be a real thing you can watch a year or so from now, but the Snyder Cut never really existed, just like a lot of us kept trying to tell you. So how'd that get so weird and confusing and silly? Well, like too many things in the internet, it's because not long after it first got rolling, the Snyder Cut stopped being mostly about the Snyder Cut for too many of the loudest voices on all sides of it. And let me be very clear about all this. At this point, I'm pretty sure that an overwhelming plurality of people who tossed release the Snyder Cut around casually on social media over the last two years were mainly fans of the characters, the movies, the genre, or just film fans who wanted to see a different take. And that's cool. I'm all for seeing alternate cuts, extra footage, things of that nature, especially in cases like these where extraordinary circumstances were involved that changed the production in major ways. I mean, if you've seen both versions of Kingdom of Heaven, it'll blow your mind how different they are. It's astonishing. Unfortunately, as happens in much the same way that too many online movements that should only be about good faith engagement between fans and creators or just customers and studios, the Snyder Cut discourse quickly became dominated, at least in most public spaces, by only the loudest and most provocative voices, despite, again, being almost certainly a non-representative minority of fans for whom it was clearly less about the director's artistic integrity or their fellow fans' vindication and more about the idea of the Snyder Cut's symbolic value in some overstated culture war between one or more different styles of superhero movie making, with all sorts of socio-political tendrils bound up in its musculature, to the point where, for many media pundits and entertainment journalists who cover the superhero movie scene, the release hashtag came to be associated less with the mythical lost version of Justice League and more with a rotating crew of social media trolls, who seemed to care less and less about the movie than about waging an imaginary battle against the Disneyfication of culture or railing against subsequent DCEU features for embracing different aesthetics or some other conspiracy. Again, it's clear that this was never the majority or even a meaningfully representative sample of people who were merely enthused or curious about a movie, but having seen what the receiving end of it looks like, I understand why some might be a bit apprehensive of the notion of that misguided pocket of bad faith actors getting to feel validated in their actions. I mean, what kind of message does that send, right? But, on the other hand, I'm also of the opinion that you should not penalize fans, filmmakers, or a movie that didn't do anything wrong for the bad actions of those who did. It's not Zack Snyder's fault that a small number of people who acted badly in relation to what likely started out as genuine appreciation of his work and the perceived raw deal that he got from multiple angles on this project. Basically, yeah, I don't like that a few jerks are going to spend the next few months feeling like they won the gold medal at the Jerk Olympics over this, but not enough to want to see the filmmakers and fans, real fans, not get to win out. And overall, I'm interested in it. Look, everyone knows I detested Batman v Superman and was disappointed by Justice League, and I don't exactly expect to have my mind completely changed on this, but Zack Snyder's a unique and incredibly talented filmmaker, and the circumstances around his departure were pretty heartbreaking, regardless of the film, so the prospect of seeing any director who had to vacate a project like that getting to take a second pass at it where we actually get to watch it as a real thing and not a work print or some hypothetical is something that anyone who's passionate about the craft of movie making and the integrity of individual filmmakers should not only be interested in, but champion just for happening. I mean, this is an exciting development, and of course it also raises a lot of questions about what, if anything, it means for the future of the still-developing DC film world. I mean, I've got a lot of questions. In fact, they're gonna need their own whole episode. Next time. I'm Bob, and that's The Big Picture. Okay, so last week we all found out that the Snyder Cut, or something like it, is coming out to HBO Max streaming and talked about what that means. And now, as promised, we're going to talk about what that might actually look like, because I said we were going to do that. Let's go over some movie industry business stuff that seems to have some people needlessly confused. 
Hollywood keeps copious notes. The film industry does a lot of record keeping, both in order to keep track of things and also best keep track of what's not actually being kept track of. Sounds kind of like the current government and or organized crime? Well, ain't you a smart cookie. Industry trade guilds and unions wield an enormous amount of power, and as such, every aspect of a studio production has to be documented or proved that properly licensed crew and workers were used on various jobs, or if that's not the case, that you got a waiver or allowance of some kind, even for pickups and reshoots. That includes coverage, crowd scenes, background plates, green screen footage of shit blowing up to be composited into an effect shot, an extra stunt, whatever. So if anything like that ends up getting done in order to complete this new cut of Justice League, even for a minute or two of footage total, is something that would and likely will be called a reshoot in certain circumstances on certain record-keeping ledgers, depending on who's asking the question, who's giving the answer, and in what context, but also not on others, which would mean, and in fact does mean, you shouldn't put too much stock into people involved in the production giving conflicting information, or even yes they are, no they aren't answers about it, because that's the business. Hollywood uses outdated, archaic terminology. The film industry is still called that, even though most movies aren't shot entirely on film, and in fact digital cameras don't cop capture images in a way that makes the terms shooting or shot all that appropriate either. Justice League, for the record, was mostly shot on 35mm film, but it certainly was not processed and edited that way. Also, they still refer to different versions of a film as cuts, even though, as noted, most editing is done digitally and there's no cutting actually involved. Big chips turn slowly, what do you want? Anyway, an effects-heavy film like Justice League is largely comprised of scenes shot mainly on green screen or partially green screen sets, actors are sometimes not in the same scene and patched together later in the same way, multiple takes are used, and digital trickery is often used to make it less obvious that in real life, really, really tall Ben Affleck and Jason Momoa aren't towering over all the other regular people-sized actors to a comically absurd degree. And after all that, the whole thing then has to get digitized and color time to do that summer blockbuster mood lighting but outdoors somehow glow up that can look radically different depending on however you want to do it, i.e. remember how the finale of this looked all bluey in the early trailers, but it was all RNG in the final version, well, sufficient changes or additions like that that need to get made or created, even if they only exist in the post-production computers, are considered new scenes as far as the industry is concerned, especially since it's highly unlikely anybody color-timed, animated, or finalized all of the scenes that didn't end up in the released version, and if they did, they're in a ledger somewhere, and not in another ledger elsewhere. See previous section. Just look at these effects breakdowns and behind-the-scenes clips playing during this episode for a small studio marketing-approved taste of exactly how much of a film of this type is made up of piecemeal elements, and then remember that these are themselves touched up edits from PR packages designed to make the production look much more smooth than it actually was. So you're not seeing anything like a group shot having been made up from different people's individual green screen plates on multiple days because not everyone was available or CGI covering up a wardrobe malfunction. Which is why, despite the understandable misuse of shorthand by fans and now studio marketing, there never was a completed Snyder cut to simply release, which is why instead of releasing it now, they're gonna spend 20 to 30 million more in post production to turn whatever was already there into a killer app for a streaming service. So, with all that out of the way, what exactly will this movie even be? Alright, so I hope we're now all on the same page about it. A filmmaker's cut of a movie, while at one point originally meant to refer to a completed version of a film cut together as a whole, what it now more often refers to is an assemblage of footage mostly finished in roughly the order, pace, tone, and texture the filmmaker was aiming for, usually also including a version of the preferred music, sound design, whole general aesthetic. It doesn't have to be a finished cut, but it's gotta be close enough, and the main idea is to say, this is my story, this is how I'm telling it, we can polish it, we can trim it, but this is my movie. As far as anyone knows, there was at one point between four and five different versions of that level of an edit for Justice League running at various lengths over three hours apiece, being shown to various parties under various circumstances by Zack Snyder prior to the point where he exited the production along with a nearly five hour, basically the long take of every damn thing we shot assembly cut, put together for reference by the studio. The general amalgamated ideal version of those three hour versions collectively comprise what has come to be known as the Snyder Cut, which depending on who you ask was something Warner Brothers deemed unwatchable and in need of drastic salvage, or too similar to Batman v Superman for a studio that was now moving in another direction from that. Either way, it was estimated at the time that somewhere in the area of $30 million was going to be required to complete the film as was under Snyder. That's about what they've put together now, so whatever it ends up being will probably be in the eye of the audience. What is clear is that whatever they're doing won't involve shooting any new footage with the film's actors. That seems to have been confirmed by most parties, which makes sense given two of the main heroes have now retired from their roles and it's not super clear that anything else is going to happen with at least two of the others. So while new shots might not be created or reworked from existing elements, it's not likely that the main story of the new version will diverge much from the story of the original film, save for re-including supporting characters and plot details that were ultimately cut from the theatrical release. For those of you, as ever, very, very, 
very lucky people, seriously, you don't know how lucky you are, who don't have to either know or retain knowledge of this stuff for a living before all but one of these movies that went into production in this period turned out to be really, really bad. Zack Snyder wasn't just directing several films in the DC Extended Universe, he was broadly in charge of sketching out an initial multi-film arc, which would center on five film central storyline from Man of Steel to Batman v Superman and concluding in a Justice League trilogy, which would involve time travel and branch off solo features between the big team-ups for the various League members and also spin-offs like Suicide Squad, the League trilogy primarily involving a large-scale conflict between the heroes and the alien villain Darkseid that would feature a downbeat Good Guys Lose Part 2, and a post-apocalyptic Part 3 set in the real-world version of the Nightmare Vision from Batman v Superman, while the solo features would feel free to take place at different points in time, unlike the mostly linear Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline. The initial exception being Suicide Squad, which would introduce Steppenwolf, Parademons, Motherboxes, and other new gods and apocalypse material as its villains to set up the Justice League movie. Sadly, or not, depending on how that all sounds to you, the studio's, huh, maybe this isn't what we want our next decade plus of investments to look like reaction to the audience's, oh god, please make it stop reaction to Batman v Superman, WHY DID YOU SAY THAT name? and led to more than half of that plan, which had already seen Justice League get trimmed from three movies to two somewhere in the planning, getting pretty much blown up and bulldozed as much as they possibly could. Suicide Squad got its villains completely reworked to be more self-contained, Justice League's order was cut down to just one movie with a script and storyline needing to be significantly condensed to a one-off that could maybe spawn more entries if people still cared, and all the solo projects, except for the already in production Wonder Woman and Aquaman, got put in the wheel C pile. Eventually, Snyder left the production altogether to deal with a family tragedy, the film was finished under the supervision of the producers, and a pinch-hitting Joss Whedon, the rest of it happened, and now here we are. Everybody got that? No actual scripts were written for the proposed second and third Justice League movies before they were cancelled, and it doesn't appear as though much actual work was done on the first film before that became the case, so it's pretty unlikely that anything being added back in is going to be pointed at setting up those. As, as much as some are already beginning to hope and speculate, even if this were to turn into a major success for HBO Max, the ship appears to have sailed for at least two, if not more, of the actors, and the studio has largely moved on. For one thing, while there hasn't been much word on it in a bit, director Ava DuVernay of A Wrinkle in Time is still officially contracted to make a New Gods movie at Warner Brothers featuring characters like Darkseid and others, so versions that turned up here probably wouldn't be showing up again there. As is, it's not 100% clear how much of these characters there is to restore. Scenes featuring a younger dark side that were replaced by Steppenwolf in theatrical versions flashbacks are known to exist, along with a more familiar version turning up in later appearances. Steppenwolf was also supposed to be sporting a different appearance, the mother boxes were scripted to contain remains of the villain's actual mother, and there was also bigger roles for the briefly grimp Green Lanterns from those same flashbacks. Willem Dafoe's character from Aquaman was meant to appear, Amber Heard was going to have a bigger role along with the Amazons from Wonder Woman, Joe Morton would have had a bigger role alongside an actor playing a version of the Ryan Choi Adam, Iris West would have been a part of Barry Allen's story, and Flash would have had more scenes with Batman, and at least one scene would have seen the return of Harry Lennox's military character from Man of Steel in a twist that would reveal he'd actually been the Martian Manhunter this whole time. There were also other details and rumors that people have speculated about, many relating to the Superman Resurrection subplot, which was almost totally reshot and reworked with CGI in the theatrical version, particularly whether or not people would have seen Henry Cavill in a version of the black and silver Death of Superman costume, but otherwise, yeah, all indications point to basically being the same movie with a more coherent tone and more stuff stuffed into it. Maybe that's really enough, we'll see. The X Factor, then, is how much they can afford to do, what the studio is actually paying for and what Zack and Deborah Snyder have in mind with this amount of time later creatively. The general industry buzz has been that Warner Brothers and the DC film producers are still decidedly not interested in revisiting or reviving any version of this moment in their universe apart from the surprise mega success of Aquaman, which departed significantly from the Snyder era aesthetic, and the hoped for continued popularity of Wonder Woman 1984, which is reportedly an even bigger style change for the brand. Instead, the driving force behind Zack Snyder's Justice League as a streaming venture in its own right is said to be the new corporate ownership at AT&T, which were mainly interested in the prospect of using the excess footage to potentially turn the Snyder cut into a Mandalorian-style miniseries without having to spend Mandalorian-level money. Whether or not they do, that probably depends on whether it's actually possible to turn some combination of the 4-5 to five hour assembly cut, the Snyder cut, and whatever 30 million in reshoots buys you in 2020 into multiple cliffhanger-ending episodes instead of one long three-act movie, and whether Snyder is willing to further slice up his own already thoroughly King Solomon creation. But there's also the question of whether he's had any kind of creative change of view toward the project since then. Once he gets back in there, how much more tinkering is he going to want to do, and are we going to get something even more different still? And while I would say that there's almost zero chance of any of this retooling to be something that leads out to further adventures of anything related to this story or versions of these characters. I mean, even now, Warners has gone and just yanked the band-aid off the whole, we're just gonna do whatever, call it a multiverse, and hand wave the inconsistencies with a winking flash cameo that can mean whatever we want it to mean. I'm Barry Allen. No! What does that mean? How can this... This should be impossible now. It should be impossible now? You don't know about the... Oh my god, don't do this to me. I don't know about the what. You okay? I don't know if this is possible. It's not 
impossible that something similar might not get dropped in here just in case someone in corporate now wants to say, hey, so we still don't really have a plan here, so here's some hand wavium to leave the door open in case, like, Henry Cable wants to do Superman again in something in case he gets a break in between seasons of stupid on purpose version of Game of Thrones. Then again, we're all still a year or more out from this whole thing that doesn't have a set form or release date, so they could still decide to do more or less to it yet. In the end, the only thing we know for sure in the much, much bigger picture is that the combination of the unexpected pandemic-induced break in productions combined with the very much expected explosion of new streaming services desperate for content is all but guaranteed to make further experiments in this what's sitting in the vault that we can touch up and resell like it's a new thing stunt releases an increasingly regular occurrence. So who knows what all their kind of oddities were in for then? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. And so, summer 2020 passed with plenty of events, but not really any movement for the DCEU or Warner Brothers, at least not out in public that anyone knew of while well, the machinations of making and releasing Zack Snyder's Justice League took place and we all geared up for Wonder Woman 1984 to <laughs> get things back on track. Until August, when the first signs to emerge that AT&T was about to start cutting the fat at Warner Brothers and the first axes to fall were at DC Publishing, which served as something like a harbinger for the somewhat tepid rollout of the planned DC Fandome online exclusive streaming convention that was supposed to supplement their non-availability from the cancelled Comic-Con, both of which were covered in kind here. Oh boy, actual breaking news! Looks like Monday night the hammer fell at DC Comics, which has pretty much been expected for months now ever since the merger of AT&T and Warner Brothers made a bunch of parts of the corporate machine redundant, or at least irrelevant, but had been kind of put off or not worried as much about because, you know, this whole plague thing. Most expectedly, it looks as though the DC Universe streaming service is basically toast, though not exactly a shocker given that Warner Brothers has already scattered most of its marquee exclusives completely or partly to the four winds. Doom Patrol is now now shared with HBO Max, the same fate was likely coming for Titans, whenever that comes back. Where's Batman? Fuck Batman. Stargirl is moving full-time to CW, where it was probably supposed to be all along, if you're being honest. And while Holly Quinn hasn't gotten its Season 3 renewal yet, people who were expecting that to come at the DC Fandome virtual event in two weeks were also expecting that it had jumped partly or fully to Max as well, since it's already airing its reruns on Sci-Fi because Warner Brothers looked at social media and YouTube and realized, hey, this show would really have an audience, except nobody actually watches DC Universe. Slightly less expected, though again, not entirely unexpected, is the paradox more precise yet severe bloodletting supposedly going down at DC Publishing, where it's reported that the comic book side of the company's editor-in-chief, senior vice president of publishing strategy and support services, VP of marketing and creative, VP of global publishing initiatives and digital strategy, senior story editor, and executive editor positions were among the top-level positions vacated, with longtime comics hand Jim Lee remaining in his COO role, but ousted from publishing duties and something like a third of the editorial staff overall given their walking papers. Please disperse! Nothing to see here, please! Now, obviously, that's terrible news for everyone involved. Few people get into the comics industry for reasons other than affection for the medium, and everyone is exiting into a perilous job market wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing likelihood of an incoming sustained economic depression wrought by other factors. But if you're seeking context outside the sphere of immediate business factors, the type of layoffs involved, if the reports are indeed accurate as of this recording, i.e. focus so heavily on the editorial, marketing, and promotion strategy side of the company, effectively constitute the removal of everyone with a significant say in the overall direction of the company's output. What gets published, who gets hired to write and draw what, and how and where it gets sold and marketed, what audiences get sold to, which properties get pushed harder than others, etc. Now bear in mind, this arrives not at all long after the ousting of former longtime publisher Dan Didio, right near the start of the 18th merger, a move that many believe was related to his being the supposed architect of the rumored DC 5G line-wide brand refresh of the company's central superhero comics continuity, the prospective scope of which you may recall me outlining back in March when that news broke, and also, unrelatedly, so did my vocal cords for a few weeks. Remember how that sounded? 
Supposedly, again, this is all based on scant early reporting, semi-confirmed leaks, and everybody knows in this scuttle at this point who even really can say. The big idea, well, part of it, was a big, line-wide identity refresh with an eye on diversity in new markets, aka these brands were thought up in the 30s and 40s, but we're making movies out of them for a global audience in 2020, so give us something to work with, by way of scrapping the mainstream DC Comics timeline of any Marvel-style elasticity. In other words, a new timeline where instead of however many 90 years or so worth of storylines DC currently considers canonical, all having happened in an absurdly compressed amount of time between the mid-80s or so and now, baby Superman's rocket lands on the Kent's farm back in either my parents' or grandparents' days, I guess. Again, none of this was technically official yet. All of the various DC heroes and their stories play out over decades and decades, and thus in the present, aka right now, 2020, all the major A-plus Justice League level name heroes are either old as hell and retired, or presumably dead, and new people have carried on their positions. In some cases, not necessarily the inheritors people would automatically expect, i.e. Superman and Lois Lane's son Jonathan Kent is supposedly the new Superman, Luke Fox, son of Lucius Fox, also the second adoptee of the Batwing mantle, is Batman, Captain Boomerang's son Owen might be the new Flash, because he's also the son of a woman related to the reverse Flash via time travel, I'm not explaining that, and either Nubia or a descendant thereof may be the new Wonder Woman, or maybe not. And also, presumably a bunch of other new people taking up a bunch of other old names and entirely new ideas and new names that this or that creator wants to take a shot on as well, and because this is a DC publishing initiative, it was slated to be preceded and rolled out concurrently with an escalating series of smaller event scale series retelling the for now official story of when everything happened and how, breaking the official timeline into four eon spanning generations of DC continuity leading into a fifth generation or DC 5G or G5 or Gen 5 or Generation 5, no one seems to have settled yet, as the cool new young people in famous capes main DC universe. Yeah, so does this mean that 5G is dead for good? It certainly could. Basically everyone who would have been involved in plotting out any future direction for DC is gone now. So keeping or junking any of their work will be up to their replacements. That's at least what it looks like. If so, that kind of sucks regardless of what it would have eventually been or how you felt about the prospect in my opinion, if only because anyone currently working on what was going to be will have seen a bunch of their work go down the drain and not have much to show for it. And meanwhile, the particular subset of just the absolute worst sort of people who always have it in for any kind of forward-looking change in this media are certain to claim even one shift in the direction as a result of this or even just the neutral loss of jobs in general as a victory for their side in the make-believe culture war that only exists in their imagination and on their kickstarters. Of course, of all of this can't help but cast a shadow over the aforementioned upcoming DC Fandom event, which had mainly been promoted on announcements about the pending future of the DC Extended Universe in movies and television and, of course, the revisitation of the DC Extended Universe's recent past in the form of Zack Snyder's Justice League, as this is 2020, I think we're all aware, after all, that at this point the Marvel and DC publishing arms are effectively IP farms and test kitchens for their corporate parents' TV and film divisions, after all. But it was obviously going to feature comic announcements as well, and we'll certainly have to address what's going on here. Unless, of course, here was already in the planning for a while, and part of Fandom's purpose was to overshadow this with bigger news instead, which would be somewhat sketchy, but not at all out of bounds for Warner or AT&T. One imagines we'll find out what's going on soon enough. For now, I hope that absent any actual newsworthy details about the futures of the imaginary people, fans both devout and casual will do the right thing and show compassion and supportiveness to the actual people who've been left, you know, jobless in the middle of a global crisis by this, most of whom are not precisely wealthy and all of whom were very likely just fans themselves at one point as well. A constant in the comic book universe, after all, is that the likes of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, whoever, will eventually bounce back from any kind of grand upheaval or change. The people who write and draw them are not always so lucky, and we should keep that in mind whether we're on board for this or that creative change or not. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. It's almost September and I've run out of funny ways to cold open these topical episodes in reference to the fact that everything sucks and nothing is going on. I was in a store the other day and they'd already put out the Halloween stuff. Normally that's one of my favorite things to see each year, but now it just means we really did lose the entire summer, which means I feel like I've lost both things. That's probably not uplifting and I'm sorry, but I have to put something here, so there's that. Anyway, next week...
Since we didn't have Comic-Con this year because the entirely preventable lack of leadership induced rolling disaster we've just decided to take part in, apparently, Warner Brothers will be running a virtual convention for their DC Comics brand entitled DC Fandome, which promises to bring news and info about upcoming DC media project and, as of last week, hopefully run some damage control for the whole pay no attention to us having fired everyone in editorial at the actual DC Comics just now. The actual schedule of what's supposed to be discussed topic-wise and when is already online, but since the point of these things is to make news such as it is, here's part one of some top 10 predictions of what might be the big reveals at the show, loosely arranged in order of likely to happen, plus worth giving a damn about. Number 10, the air cut. It's a given that we'll find out more about Zack Snyder's Justice League at this thing because it's a big niche item for HBO Max, but since that whole thing worked out in terms of building hype to maybe turn more profit off of failed feature projects, people have managed to bootstrap a lookalike movement together for a director's cut of Suicide Squad from director David Ayer, who doesn't generally have that much going on these days and would probably do it. Unlike Justice League, the actual footage to make this supposedly more or less already exists, so if people are going to try and double dip on this concept, now would be the time and place to say sure, why not? Number 9, Birds of Prey 2. Because the way we report on and receive news about movie earnings is broken and stupid, a lot of people either forget or don't realize that Birds of Prey, or the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, was a $200 million worldwide hit on a medium-sized budget, which is not bad considering everything. Whatever you thought of the movie, I really liked it. Warner Brothers is still in the Harley Quinn business, and they, like the rest of Hollywood, want to stay in the Margot Robbie business, so do not be surprised if this is where we find out that we're getting another one of these in some form. Especially since they'll already be talking up her involvement in the already announced Suicide Squad sequel at the show officially. Number 8, Superman and Lois Explained. Okay, so this new series is slated to have some kind of fandom presence already, but, alright, short version. In case you don't follow the various TV side of these things, back a season ago and pre-pandemic, the CW Arrowverse DC shows did a miniseries crossover version of the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline, featuring a bunch of nifty cameos and continuity gags from the entire history of DC movies and TV adaptations. Holy crimson skies of death! I hope you're watching, big guy and mainly serve to collapse their own multiverse originally established to explain why Supergirl wasn't always around because that show originated on another network and therefore no longer was necessary into a single united timeline and changed a bunch of plot points, one of which was apparently giving Tyler Hoechlin's Superman and Elizabeth Tulloch's Lois Lane, previously established as occasional guest stars on Supergirl, two teenage sons, the mechanics of which have yet to be explained, but the parenting of which is apparently the main focus of this series, the first spin-off of Supergirl. See, during Crisis, they had only one child who was a baby named Jonathan, but now there's two kids who are teenagers and the other one is named Jason. So far, exactly what's going on with those two kids is the main mystery keeping prospective fans occupied. Did the timeline merging age them up? Is there going to be a years later jump for this whole universe? Where did the other kid come from? Is he an XP of the son of Brennan Routh's Clark from Superman Returns, also named Jason? At least one popular, though seemingly unlikely fan theory is that he's an adoptee and actually Damian Wayne, son of the CW timeline's retired Batman. Whatever is going on in this show, this would be the place to start cluing people in. Number 7, Black Adam and Shazam News. Shazam 2 has a story, a director, and a cast of child actors who, let's face it, aren't getting any younger, but they still can't shoot it because, you know, the whole plague thing. Still, one imagines they can tease the heck out of it, even if they can't say what it's about. One thing certainly up for discussion is how much, if at all, the franchise is actually going to brush up against the already developing Black Adam movie. Black Adam, of course, is the bad guy version of Shazam, was alluded to as existing in the previous film, and was meant to be teased in a scene that was ultimately deleted as well. Dwayne The Rock Johnson Johnson is set to play the character in his own solo feature, which has also been in development basically forever, and it's generally presumed the two will run into each other at some point, this would be the time to start setting up when and clearing up how. Number 6, Cheetah Reveal. You know, by the time it comes out, Wonder Woman 1984 will have been on the shelf for almost two years, thanks to the whole plague thing, and at this point, if they delay it any further, the edgy political gag of making the bad guy look and sound exactly like President Trump is going to be a retroactive reference to, hey, remember that dumb thing we did that one time? Instead of cheeky mockery of a public figure. The number one question on everyone's mind will be, are you still going to try and put this only in theaters, or will you bite the bullet and send it to streaming like Mulan? And since the answer is going to disappoint people no matter what it is, I wouldn't be surprised if they finally relent and just show people Kristen Wiig's cheetah final form is going to look like as a consolation prize. Yes, there's already pictures of a doll out there, but it doesn't really give a sense of what we're actually dealing with here. 
Number 5, the Suicide Squad trailer. It will surprise probably nobody that I consider the biggest missed opportunity of not having an actual San Diego Comic-Con this year, on the movie hyping side at least, to be missing out on what would otherwise easily have been one of the biggest moments of redemptive personal triumph ever in the form of James Gunn coming back to Hall H to potentially not only tuck up Suicide Squad 2, sorry about Suicide Squad 1, but also maybe take at least a public comeback bow for the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy 3 at the same show. You, of course, will recall that the fake social media outrage campaign launched by disingenuous alt-right political operatives that resulted in his removal from that project for a while happened two years ago during the 2018 convention. So seeing him step back up now at the helm of that and having been brought on board to salvage the DCEU's other failed team-up movie just would have been pretty great. You know, just an awesome moment of unspoken because he's a classy guy. Hey, everybody who tried to bring me down, screw you. More to the immediate point, the movie they're actually calling The Suicide Squad is already set to have a James Gunn-centered presentation at Fandome, and while they aren't saying we're finally going to show you the trailer, it's a sort of assume that there's going to be something, maybe a teaser, maybe some footage, something to show. At the very least, we should get a real sense of the tone, the look of the new characters, some clarification as to how much, if anything, this has to do with the first one, that kind of thing. Number 4, The Fate of DC Universe and or HBO Max Streaming. Looming large over every single media presentation about anything until there's a vaccine, better treatments, or semi-competent government to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic is the question of how exactly we're expected to watch any of this content. And with Warner Brothers in DC, that now comes with extra questions about yet-to-be-clarified fate of their bifurcated streaming situation. Not long ago, DC launched the DC Universe app, which in addition to functioning as a digital comics reader, also functioned as a streaming library for a bunch of classic DC film and TV content with a handful of original exclusive and semi-exclusive series, at least two of which received overwhelmingly terrific reviews and found loyal, dedicated audiences in the form of Doom Patrol and Harley Quinn, but neither of which actually drove that many people to purchase the app, and now pretty much everything but Titans is airing on at least one other channel. Meanwhile, the completion of the AT&T Time Warner merger allowed for the creation of the much, much, much more successful HBO Max streaming service, which immediately became one of the other channels that the DC Universe show started to migrate into coexistence on. This now has fans demand demanding, rather reasonably, a little clarity as to whether or not all the original and classic content is going to move there, and if so, do they have any reason to still have that app if they only use it for streaming? Pretty much everyone, I feel, right, we all get this, yeah, has made peace with the idea that the entire multi-service tangle era is partly or wholly deliberate awkward transition phase towards streaming bundles just becoming the new version of just having cable, but when it's this niche and specific, it feels like even Warner Brothers and HBO need to step up and take the opportunity at one or more of these events to just come out and say, here's our singular unified streaming plan, this is what it's going to look like going forward, whatever it's going to be. Number 3, Harley Quinn Season 3. Harley Quinn has no business being one of the best DC shows ever, but somehow it is. A riotous adult-only sitcom that also feels and plays like a legit great superhero action show taking the deadpan self-awareness of the Adam West Batman and asking, okay, but what if this was both as filthy as the Frank Miller Batman, but also as well-written with characterizations as human and complex as Batman the Animated Series, and telling the whole thing from the perspective of villains who, no matter how unusual their gimmick, are still just kinda going to work every day. Unfortunately, as noted, they put it on the DC Universe app at first, so it took a little while for people to figure out that it existed, let alone that they liked it, and even then it developed a fan base, part of whom was catching it in reruns and via YouTube clips. But they did get it to a second season, where the reviews got even better and viewership overall picked up via appearing on different platforms worldwide. However, a season three hasn't yet officially been ordered. The series and some folks behind it do have a presence at Fandome, though, and clips have heavily featured in the marketing packages for the event. So while it might be for the best for those same fans not to jump to any immediate conclusion, it does feel like a good bet that if season three or some other type of continuation for the franchise is going to get officially announced, it's gonna be here. Number 2, The Batman Trailer. Is it a reboot, a prequel, a sequel, a standalone spin-off, part of the existing DCEU, or something else altogether? Nobody knows exactly what the deal is with Matt Reeves' The Batman starring Robert Pattinson, other than that those of us who, like myself, were kinda hoping that watching Dawn of Justice and Justice League both eat box office pavement meant we were finally gonna move away from the ultra-dark gloom machine version of Batman to literally anything else, well just have to keep waiting, I guess. Still, people are curious about the usual stuff. What does this version look and sound like? How does the costume look? Who are the bad guys? What's the tone and aesthetic overall, etc.? And they're apparently going to start shooting again in September, so it's possible we'll finally see something like at least a teaser trailer to give people an idea of what this is meant to be and where it's supposed to all fit. And speaking of which... Number 1. The Multiverse Will Be Explained 
a moment ago when I mentioned that Warner DC's uncertain streaming future was looming over everything, well, looming right next to it is the unanswered question of the DC Cinematic Universe or Extended Universe or whatever timeline, which was blown into disarray by the bad news followed by good news scenario of the tepid to negative reception for really everything up through and including the mangled theatrical cut of Justice League kind of scuttling the interconnected plan for what was to come later, eventually leading to losing their Batman and Superman actors, and also did we ever figure out what actually happened with that whole Ezra Miller choked somebody thing? But then in between that, Wonder Woman and Aquaman made billions worldwide, and also Shazam was a solid hit, and so was Birds of Prey, and both of those more or less officially were tied into the whole project, so it isn't really over, but it also is in pieces, maybe. Nobody seems to know right now, and when we would have started getting answers, there was, you know, the plague, and everything hit pause. Supposedly, the big Hail Mary plan to fix everything at some point became retooling the perpetually delayed Flash movie, which has gone through like a dozen writers and directors, and also seriously, what happened with them, into some version of the comic's Flashpoint storyline, i.e. a Back to the Future 2-style time travel adventure where the Flash messes with history, ends up meeting different alternate timeline and uh, alt-universe versions of the other characters, and eventually has to fix the timeline in a way that would serve as an excuse for why certain people are now played by new actors and some aren't, and we're supposed to ignore some of the movies from before but not all of them, and maybe set up a hand-wavy official label reason for keeping up experimental side projects like Joker, and maybe bring over popular ideas from stuff like that or the TV and streaming projects if they want to, something that pretty much already got a placeholder tease when the CW shows did their crisis crossover last season. Found Barry Allen. Allen. No! What does that mean? How can this... This should be impossible now. It should be impossible now? You don't know about the... Oh my god, don't do this to me. I don't know about the what. Now, whether or not you think that's a good idea, Warners has been fairly coy about whether they think they'd really pull the trigger on establishing a full-blown multiverse, where anything from any part of the library can be or not be slipped into any other part and excused with because Flashpoint, hell, they won't even say whether or not they're still planning to make or call it Flashpoint, though supposedly the worst-kept secret in town is that Michael Keaton is being asked to come back and play some version of an older Bruce Wayne, maybe. Anyway, do I think they'll take fandom of all events as opportunity to chart this all out? Hell no, but between the different projects they're confirmed to be showcasing and the various announcements that are expected but not official, I feel like an acknowledgement not of here's the explanation for how these contradictory pieces are going to coalesce, but rather an acknowledgement of there will be an explanation and it will be an actual thing that matters in context is something that almost has to either drop full on or at least be very strongly alluded to. I meant to do that. Okay, did I get any of these right? Did I get any of them wrong? Did I miss anything? Next week, I'll probably tell ya. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Okay, the DC Fandom event ended over the weekend, many things were revealed, last week I shared with you my 10 predictions for what might be there, and now here are the uh, results, was I right, was I wrong, let's find out. Also, if you're wondering why there was nothing about the Justice League trailer being in there in the first time, it's because everyone knew that there would be a Justice League trailer there, so there's no point in predicting it. And, you know what, there will be plenty of time to talk about the Justice League trailer and the Hallelujah song, so let's, uh, let's just move right on. Oh boy, it's going to be a long rest of the year. Okay, so nothing about the air cut. Uh, that's not to say they're not doing it, but they certainly didn't bring it up at all during Fandome. That's not exactly surprising. That's why it was in the number 10 spot. I was trying to be positive because I had a feeling anything critical I eventually had to say would eventually get turned around into always being negative about DC movies, which isn't really the case, but whatever. So, I mean, hey, keep hope alive, handful of people who liked the first Suicide Squad. <laughs> Uh, same story for number 9, if a follow-up to Birds of Prey is happening, other than Margot Robbie coming back as Harley Quinn for Suicide Squad 2, sorry about Suicide Squad 1, it wasn't brought up here. Disappointing, not entirely unexpected, as there'd been basically no word about it, and it would've been an out-of-nowhere surprise, still wouldn't count it out, but yeah. So as it turned out, they're going to be doing all of this again on September 13th with a heavier focus on the CW, HBO Max, and other TV stuff, and it's been announced that that's where Superman and Lois will get its actual Here's What the Show Is rollout. So, guess technically this counts as a miss for number 8 on my end, too. Uh, by the way, did you know Tyler Hoechlin, who plays the CW Superman, was the little kid in Road to Perdition? Yeah, he largely left acting apart from small roles, and I think he was on 7th Heaven because he was going to be a baseball player, but he got a hamstring injury, so he went back to acting. I mean, that's a shame, because I guess baseball is what he really really wanted to do, but I hope uh, Superman works out for him, because he seems like a good guy. And if you don't watch Supergirl, he's actually really good in the part.
Well, as number seven goes, there's no actual project yet still, but Warner Brothers apparently has Dwayne The Rock Johnson still committed to, at some point, play Black Adam, a character who kind of fits anywhere in the DC Universe as either a surprisingly compelling villain or sort of a good guy, and they're not going to let us forget about it. Also, Dave Sandberg is coming back to do Shazam 2, which is now subtitled Fury of the Gods, and I guess we'll find out more about that when it becomes possible to shoot ensemble movies with casts of child actors again. Hey, I got number six, too. Cheetah is here. She looks pretty great. We're going to see Kristen Wiig doing big, crazy action stuff and turning into a psycho cat girl, which is fun because psycho cat girls have been kind of having a moment this year. And whenever, however, they decide to release it, Wonder Woman 1984 still looks like it could be the first real significant bellwether of what the future course of the DC movies actually looks like. Hey, look at number five. We got two big Suicide Squad trailers, largely one comprised of behind-the-scenes footage and the other mainly being a cast roster reveal aimed at hyping up how big it's going to be and spelling out the huge roster of new, largely obscure DC villains James Gunn has selected for the film, along with Margot Robbie, Joel Kinnaman, Jai Courtney, and Viola Davis returning as Harley Quinn, Rick Flagg, Captain Boomerang, and Amanda Waller. The new blood includes John Cena as the Peacemaker, Steve Aggie as King Shark, Pete Davidson as Black Guard, Michael Rooker as Savant, Sean Gunn as Weasel, Idris Elba as Bloodsport, Peter Capaldi as The Thinker, David Desmeljane as The Polka Dot Man, The Polka Dot Man, holy shit, Daniel Melchior as Ratcatcher 2, Flula Borg as Javelin, Nathan Fillion as TDK, also known as The Detachable Kid, uh, Malin Eng as Mongol, and Alice Braga from Queen of the South as Salsoria, so that all sounds just great. Alright, so as number four goes, technically the news on this one ended up dropping piecemeal well before the show at Fandom got underway, and it was to the surprise of no one that the original programming content of the DC Universe app was migrating to the HBO Max service. What that actually means for the app going forward is still unclear, but Jim Lee promises he'll explain it at some point. Okay, so Harley Quinn actually got a whole in-character Q&A bit with Haley Cuoco answering fan mail in character, which carried on the tradition of the best recent DC properties, making an explicit point of dunking on the Snyderverse era. Mary Kill, Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman. Oh, Wonder Woman, kill the two dudes after I torture the shit out of them and make them fight each other until they're referencing their mothers. My mommy's name is Martha, too. But they stopped short of actually confirming Season 3. This still feels like it counts as hype to me, especially since the same Q&A including an Everybody Better Subscribe to HBO Max shout-out, so presumably this is another see you in September for the actual good news thing, but still, they didn't confirm it, so alright, I'll take the L on this one. Yeah, they showed a Batman trailer, and, uh... I'm vengeance. Guys, I'm sorry, this looks so f***ing tiresome to me. I mean, d does it look bad? No, it, it looks boring. It looks ordinary. I'm sorry, it just looks okay. It, it looks like the in-betweeny parts of the last 20 years of Batman stuff to me. I look at this and I just feel like I've watched this movie 12 times, read the unbought pitches and unproduced screenplays for this 1,200 times, and the shitty fanfiction spin-off sequels based on what they did make 1,200,000 times. It's always going back to some mishmash of the long Halloween, Dark Knight Returns, Year One and Killing Joke. Yes, I was also 15 once watching normal serial killer movies and had it occurred to me, you know, this guy is basically a Batman villain, why not do one of these movies but Batman? But then I turned not 15 anymore and that no longer felt revolutionary to me. And at 39, 7 but John Doe is the Riddler and Batman is Netflix Daredevil just makes me feel tired. And it doesn't help that it mostly just looks like they could have cut in scenes directly from Batman Begins and Gotham. No, I don't want them to do a Marvel movie, whatever the hell people mean when they act like that's a singular definition of something. And I didn't necessarily have some other specific thing I wanted, just not to look and feel like their biggest new idea was to leave the amber wash filter from begins on for more of the movie this time. It's an early trailer, maybe it'll be great, I hope I'm wrong, but yet yeah, honestly seeing this just bummed me right the hell out. 
A, the multiverse. I considered this the easiest call of the weekend, and I was right, because they didn't explain it necessarily, but they confirmed it, like, the day before the show even started by announcing that Ben Affleck was going to come back and do his Batman one more time opposite Michael Keaton, presumably doing the same for Flashpoint. And the actual fandom tease for Flashpoint then involved this piece of art. So yeah, I had the top and easiest to call prediction more or less right. The big overriding DC Extended Universe plan is to let this moment of throwing random shit against the wall to see what sticks can continue to play out, and use the Flashpoint time and reality bending plot point as an excuse to play fast and loose with what does and doesn't get to be included in the MCU-style prime timeline of crossovers they're still clearly aiming to build. I mean, we'll see how it works out, I guess, my main hope being that Joaquin Phoenix says no, absolutely not, to whatever size dump truck worth of money they back up to his house to try and get Arthur Fleck Joker to show up in a Batman movie, but like, just so we're all clear, everyone, we all realize that the reason Warner Brothers DC and Disney Marvel are both doing multiverse projects now is that they both just plan to keep making this stuff forever and just adding more and more intellectual property to the mix and they don't want to always have to spend a whole movie explain why like Harry Potter or The Predator or Sonic or Michelangelo is there now, right? This is our future. This is where we live now. Just might as well let it happen, I guess. Could be worse. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Now, what Fandom would end up not revealing was a lot of future plans for theatrical and streaming that Warner Brothers or anyone else was looking at because the studios were still very much playing it by ear, partly because we didn't know what was coming from the pandemic itself, but really, let's be honest here, everyone kind of expected that the entire public health policy would completely change or get thrown out depending on who actually won the upcoming election. So by the end of September, I was running this episode that ended up mentioning DC and WB, but by necessity of topic was largely about movies the superhero genre in general and was more of a state of business, state of mind kind of thing that when I look back feels like it was important if only in incidental context. It was also, by happenstance, the last regular episode that wasn't a Schlocktober review that ran on The Escapist 2.0, so all good things, etc, etc. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the last time I was able to open one of these episodes without a joke about 2020 being an endless series of kicks in the balls, only to then realize I couldn't even remember or find an instance of where it was meant to as a joke and not some kind of bit or sincere expression of regret and bitterness expressed in the form of withering criticism so as to put my audience at ease that the host was not in fact just stewing in actual resentment and misery for months on end because who wants to hear about that? Anyway, I guess we're leaning into the stereotype and doing two Marvel episodes this week because newsworthiness is clickworthiness specifically since it's now crushingly obvious that Tenet didn't make it happen in theaters, and Mulan only kinda made it happen on premium VOD during the pandemic, so big movie time is just not starting up again until we either have a real vaccine, or the country where most of the big movies get made still decides on whether all the machinery of society is going to start functioning competently again in January, or continue falling apart for however long that actually takes. And thus, we've now learned that a bunch of blockbuster movies that we're banking on maybe possibly trying to come out in the fall and winter are instead being pushed ahead once more into next year, which at this point isn't really really new so much as a desperate inevitability that's let smug unpleasant people make bad jokes about how they don't really care while people with souls and human empathy remember that the arts and entertainment industry represents millions of individual actual working class jobs that have either been lost, slashed, frozen, or decimated by this and feel badly about it. But this time it came loaded with a certain amount of grim direct symbolism with the Disney Corporation and Marvel Studios finally making the not unexpected but still previously in question decision to move both Black Widow and the Eternals all the way into 2021. 2020 will now become the first year since 2009, a period of 11 years that there has not been a Marvel Cinematic Universe feature in theaters. To head off the obvious instinct of people who only exist to do so, to dismiss even mentioning this as even symbolically relevant, i.e. you just posted cringe, which is certainly one way of expressing I don't understand the concept of symbolic resonance, obviously this rates effectively below the level of human visibility on the scale of things that are actual problems in the age of COVID-19. People have died after all 
all, but it's kind of hard not to see an obviously unintended and certainly coincidental metaphor by happenstance in the timing and finality of it, in the aftermath of a year where we've watched the institutions, leaders, officials, laws, etc. that we, well, some of us, once thought we could rely on for at least a sense of security simply fail over and over again, failing to contain or manage a plague, failing to equitably enforce the law, failing to hold itself accountable to the law, kind of ties a neat, if comparably inconsequential, bow on the whole awful package to have even something as trifling like a movie release schedule literally now say, this was the year where there weren't any heroes. Oh god. Which, of course, symbolic gut punch aside, isn't even truly accurate. Birds of Prey came out this year, Wonder Woman 1984 is still gonna try and make it in for the December holidays, and even Marvel apparently got WandaVision in the can before the buzzer, so there's still gonna be that. But theatrically, unless we're counting New Mutants, and nobody is, the streak is essentially broken, and the only reason it's probably not going to be a discussion of, was this a better movie year without them at all or not, is because this entire year is just kind of a mulligan for the whole business. But okay, it's not that big a deal, but it feels like it is, because any annual tradition thing that lasts over a decade and suddenly stops is going to feel like that, and there's a temptation, which of course we're currently culturally encouraged to give into in some circles, to treat it like not only a non-event but a good thing because anything popular has to be bad or unimportant. After all, isn't it wrong that the dominant popular culture mythology of the preceding decade has been a post-national consumer pop mythology unmoored from any specific political or philosophical ethos beyond the necessity of good guys to line up along a shared sense of camaraderie and destroy an army of bad guys? Is this not the homogenous mind killer that's erasing our sense of root and culture, locking us into atomized, neoliberal consumer mindset to be little more than receiver drones in a dystopian corporate wasteland wrought forth by the transnational financial conspirators imposing their- Wow, you really can draw that conspiracy horseshit out to sound almost harmless and reasonable if you just mute all the implicit anti-Semitism, right? Damn, there's probably a lesson in that one, kiddos. In all seriousness, as I've said many times in the past, of course it's not good for one company to own all of the things. Disney or anyone else having as much sway as it does over the collective popular mythology is debatable to the degree it's a net negative, but it's definitely not a net positive, but you know, like I said about earlier, where things are on the problem scale, Disney business is pretty far down there as well, all things considered, in my opinion. The fact is, popular mythology is what it is for a reason. It serves a communal purpose for the human collective. It's kind of weird to me that a lot of people who claim they care so deeply about the concerns of the working man or ordinary people or families just getting by are so quick when it comes to culture, entertainment, art, the things people do to help themselves get by psychologically day to day, they just dismiss them out of hand. I mean, I'm a fan of this stuff, but I'm also a film critic and a student of the broader form, and I've never had any problem or hesitation saying that however popular it is, whether I enjoy most of the Marvel ephemera, it's still mostly a bunch of B-plus efforts that occasionally coalesce into something more, but there's also no question that the MCU experiment has turned into something bigger and culturally unifying for people around the world and across language and culture barriers, and it means something more than not just these mostly pretty good action movies, but also most works of modern fiction in general seem to mean to people at the moment, for better or for worse. And I can think of no better illustration than that, that if you've been on social media during any kind of mass collective mourning or tragedy or moment of grief over, you know, the last couple years, but especially the last few months, of which there's been a lot. You and I both know that one of the most commonly posted, shared, and reshared let's all re-experience this and feel better pieces of media is this. Now, to be clear, not just that scene, which is a lot of fun, but mainly the sense memory of the collective human joy in that reaction to it. The things that bring people together like that don't have to be high art, or pandering, or spring from an entirely uncynical source, or be even ideologically coherent. They just have to work. And even if it's not what works for you or me, acknowledging reality kind of dictates recognizing that for a lot of people who just get up, go to work, do their best, and just want to live as well as they can manage, in what's not generally a terribly good world right at the moment, semi-inconsequential but big and unifying things like the next Marvel movie, the Super Bowl, the World Cup, uh, Eurovision, I, I guess, American here, we only found out that that was a thing that exists like five or ten years ago, is a thing to look forward to, and losing it sucks for people on some level. And in the case of this, specifically, yeah, I really do feel like the Avengers and company became, for a lot of folks, at least an idea of heroes that they could at least have as a psychological presence in an age where we keep finding out again and again that the quote-unquote real heroes are just gonna let us down, go away, or never existed in the first place. And I'm not too cynical to understand why people are hurting without them. 
I'm going to miss him. Yeah, we were friends, you know. And for their sake, I hope we have them back soon too, because it turns out we really did need them after all. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. And so, COVID-19 headed into its first fall, and things got really rather unhappy on my end. I didn't really talk about it a whole lot on the show, because, to be honest, a lot of people uh, lost a lot more than I did, and it feels selfish to take up space for my troubles, but, you know, when others had it worse. But for what it's worth, as things contracted economically all over the industry, there were losses all around, and I was someone who felt it, yeah. Uh, my second round of employment with the Escapist came to a conclusion, uh, this time on much more amicable terms. I was finally able to recapture all of the rights to my work and concepts of the big picture merchandise and licensing purposes. Uh, that was really part of the main impetus of starting the show back up there in the first place. So that meant when the show went back to being an indie channel on YouTube and Patreon, I was able to preserve it in that form. Uh, we also ended up having to reduce a lot of studio space and production facilities on this end though and scale back a lot of plans for some in-development projects, so that wasn't great. We're still rebuilding, but like I said, could have been a lot worse, and I'm grateful for what I have. Uh, for one thing, I could be Warner Brothers, for example, because this was the point where you really started to see the wheels come off of that. Uh, what was meant to be the big showdown between Wonder Woman and Black Widow at the box office, the battle of the female superheroes, uh, got scuttled by pandemic scheduling entirely, and then Warner Brothers, uh, having taken a publicity beating from all ends on how they'd handled the Tenet release over the summer, revealed its big plans for putting everything on streaming and theaters simultaneously, a move that would outrage the industry and ultimately play a significant role in everything that would unfold next. So let's watch uh, how we had to say about that. So after over a year of playing chicken with release dates, Warner Brothers blinked. Wonder Woman 1984 will go straight to streaming in about a month via HBO Max alongside a limited theater drop, and Black Widow is still on track for theaters only in April. Oh. At least as of this recording. So is that it? Did Disney Marvel win? Did Warner DC lose? Did you not realize these two films were being arbitrarily framed as indirect competition in the entertainment press and fandom circles for various idiotic reasons? Well, you see, in much the same way that fans of very specific age will recall the third Star Wars being advertised as Revenge of the Jedi or Peter Jackson's Hobbit adaptations originally launching as two films before ballooning into a trilogy mid-release, it may remain fresh in some minds that before summer 2020 became the year Hollywood took a mulligan and thanks to coronavirus we may never find out if there was actually such a thing as Marvel fatigue after Avengers Endgame, since there's now been an unplanned year-long interruption, they could release something as lackluster as that Inhumans pilot movie and it'd probably do gangbusters business, the story of this soon conclude year's now scuttled blockbuster season was on many fronts set to be a contest wherein Hollywood's two top intellectual property collectors whipped them out to measure who had the biggest lack of di as in the respective Disney and Warner Brothers slates were set to be headlined by blockbusters not only starring, directed by, and heavily marketed to women, but also carrying hefty baggage related to their own IP background, pop cultural presence, and position in this or that socio-political meta-narrative because, hey, election year on that front. Now, broadly, this would include Disney's live-action Mulan, which was aiming to both realign the company's hit-or-miss fortunes at the Chinese box office and further update the empowerment underpinning of one of their merchandisable, quasi-copywritten princess brands, and Warner Brothers' late winter releasing of Birds of Prey, which which, along with the obligatory cheeky girl power antics and immediate benefit of keeping Margot Robbie happy with her studio contract, could arguably be seen as part of the ongoing apology for Suicide Squad and maybe something like a deliberate counter-programming to this whole thing. But everyone knew the real head-to-head -head comparison, still grossly unfair and inevitably sexist in the why do we have to make these comparisons in the first place but real nonetheless way, were going to be the respective performances of Wonder Woman 1984 and Black Widow, both prequels existing under unusual circumstances, both headlined by female characters known for being somewhat thankless, undervalued in their respective franchise tentpole team-up movie, though differentiated by Wonder Woman having debuted in a well-reviewed standalone hit several years prior, which itself effectively revived hope in the theatrical viability of the DC Extended Universe project 
following the disastrous performance of Batman v Superman, only to then see said viability tank once again following the disastrous production and even more disastrous release of Justice League, framed as both a sequel to its own predecessor but also a prequel to the rest of the characters' appearances and widely speculated to be the beginning of a potential soft reboot of the entire cross-brand continuity, 1984 was set to feature a significant tonal and stylistic separation not simply from the first Wonder Woman but also its mandate to connect to the possibly no longer fully canonical Zack Snyder aesthetic continuity and a reportedly top-secret storyline involving Pedro Pascal as a villainous version of DC Comics mainstay Max Lord clearly reimagines Totus to let Diana take down an obvious stand-in for President Donald Trump. How subtle. Life is good, but it can be better. All you need is to want. Black Widow, meanwhile, was to have literally the entire weight of the post-Endgame Marvel Cinematic Universe hovering over it, with Scarlett Johansson's character having died during the events of the last Avengers film. This purported prequel was also coming with an extra layer of bite for fans who'd consistently felt the original female member of the team had been consistently shafted. This was to be Marvel in something to prove mode on that front, with questions to answer and the usual challenges of introducing new characters along with added questions of how much ground this was going to lay for the future of the planet's biggest and most widely followed cinematic universe. I mean, sure, anyone who'd grok the trailers for the thing had likely keyed in that the MCU probably had another decently entertaining winner on their hands. They're very good at making these things at this point, after all. Florence Pugh as maybe the new Black Widow, Rachel Weisz doing the black leather body stalking assassin thing, Taskmaster as the villain, David Harbour as Captain Communism, basically. <laughs> Still fits. I mean, yeah, this looks fun, it was probably gonna work, but after wrapping the major storylines of the original MCU and effectively retiring most of the founding cast, there was an open question of whether audiences were ready to follow not only more Marvel stories, period, but an openly stated aim to focus shift in new, diverse characters, reflecting a globalized audience demographic, and to a certain extent, Black Widow's capacity to bridge those eras was very much the big hovering challenge question, as much as Wonder Woman's open antagonism toward the soon-to-be former president. So you might say that among all of the other much, much more important things, Things the pandemic took from us. One of them was the ridiculous spectacle of seeing two ginormous corporations try to outwoke one another via their mega budget superheroine properties, and now the prospect of possibly seeing that battle instead play out in the streaming world instead appears to not be in the offing, since only one is deciding to play that game. I mean, sure, it could change. Black Widow could end up on Disney Plus, and dozens of people in my industry could get to write their Natasha versus Diana puff pieces after all, but it kind of seems unlikely to me. The fact is, all spin aside, Wonder Woman 1984 is landing where it is because regardless of what the studio thinks of the film itself, they've delayed it four times for almost a year now because of the pandemic dates shifting, and the rest of the DC movies haven't moved ahead much because of those same production stoppages. Meanwhile, HBO Max really needs the original content. The service has been struggling. It launched without much major content or enough device and partner deals secured in the first place. I mean, why do you think the Snyder Cut deal happened at all? It's not because someone at AT&T keeps seeing those Hallelujah trailers and thinks, yeah, we made a good decision here. That's not a knock on the service. It's actually a ton of good shit on HBO Max, from the old Criterion and TCM libraries, the WB back catalog, a lot of obscure movies you can't see anywhere else, but that's not the stuff that drives subscriber spikes, unfortunately. I wish it was. Now, by contrast, the number one reason you're not seeing Black Widow on Disney Plus is that neither the service nor the movie really need each other's help. Disney Plus isn't Netflix or Amazon Prime, but they've got a lot of kid stuff. It's Disney after all. The second season of The Mandalorian is a hit. WandaVision is coming up right after that, so there's Marvel product for them right there and plenty of it. Soul is going to hit at the same time Wonder Woman is. Bottom line, they're not hurting for subscriptions. Shit, they've probably been happy with their numbers since Hamilton got dropped out over the summer. And as mentioned earlier, we're probably never going to know what the actual non-COVID normal timeline appetite was for a solo Black Widow movie or any immediate post-Endgame Marvel movie other than Spider-Man because now anything they release is going to get a gigantic boost just from the cultural significance of the global audience knowing that their Marvel pals are back in a big return of stability, hope, you know, you have not been abandoned after a... Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> On your left. 
Okay, Kevin, this is getting a little spooky. But yeah, well, it'll probably get written about this way regardless. Where these two movies end up is much more about what's going on with their respective studios and a lot less about some kind of grudge match, despite what you might see in the headlines. So, if nothing else, one less weird, pointless culture war. Be thankful for that, I guess. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Uh, I was kind of hoping that a few more weeks would go by before we had to revisit this particular topic, or at least if we did have to do it straight off, it'd be like a short thing and we could do something else as like a bonus at midweek, since there really isn't anything to stop me from doing more than one of these shows in a given period anymore, other than my own timing, number of hours in a day, week, and yeah, that's pretty much it. But as it is, if I did end up doing something else this week, it's probably going to end up being more about whatever Disney announces on this same subject when they do their big investor call about the Marvel and Star Wars slates on Thursday, so yeah, hope you like panicked last minute studio executive reactions to short term pandemic induced market shifts that they should have pre-gamed against months ago but didn't, and will overcorrect for instead now, and thus pay for in a series of rolling disasters for years on end, because I guess that's what we're doing for this week, apparently. So, you might remember earlier this year, when we were still in the hardly anyone even knows what COVID-19 even does yet, and no one knows how long this was going to last, and the government is run by evil fucking idiots who don't believe in science, period, of pandemic total uncertainty, there was this big controversy about whether the big summer movies originally scheduled to be in theaters should still be there, or go straight to streaming in the name of public safety, and for a hot minute it all came down to Disney's Mulan and Christopher Nolan's Tenet from Warner Brothers, and with the mouse eventually turning their Wuxia Princess flick into a premium streaming event for Disney+, Plus, well, Warner Brothers stuck to their guns on Tenet as a theater-only release despite the health risk controversy, largely promoting the decision and the release itself around an auteur vision argument championed by Nolan himself, who insisted that the theatrical IMAX presentation was key to the proper audience appreciation of his artistic intent and that it was important to encourage audiences and also journalists and film critics who were also denied access to the film unless they wanted to brave the theatrical venues to come out and support the theater business financially during difficult economic times. At the time, I had this to say about that position vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Nolan theatrical distribution now must be turned back on with all the attendant risk to theater workers, cleaners, attendees that entails in order to ensure that his particular artistic vision is received in exactly the manner he planned. And whether that's marketing or self-promotion or actual persona, it can only be described from where I sit as coming off like spectacular levels of tone-deaf, callous, egomaniacal self-involvement. I mean, how much more plainly do I have to say it? I liked Inception as much as anyone, but I'm not going to risk getting sick and dying to watch another one. And while we're on the subject, Chris, if this is purely an ego trip thing, y'all need to slow down, bro. I mean, you're good, but all the film bros declaring you the new whoever for a decade might have finally gone to your head. Reality check. You ain't fun enough to be Orson Welles, you ain't prolific enough to be Hitchcock, your craftsman bona fides aren't genuine enough to be Mann, Frankenheimer, Ridley, or Tony, and you ain't interesting enough to be Kubrick. Now, the artistic argument is obviously subjective, but whatever you think of the economic argument, didn't work out. Audiences, especially in the U.S., either did not feel safe returning to theaters or were not compelled to take that risk by tenant in sufficient numbers. No other major studios or even Warner Brothers itself followed suit with their other blockbusters, and as a result, the theater industry saw further losses. It actually looked to many as though businesses would have been more financially secure, remaining mostly locked down, than spending the money to attempt a moonshot reopening just for tenant, which ultimately didn't pay any dividends. So now the situation is worse than ever and will probably continue getting worse without some form of industry bailout since situation in the offing. Anyway, fast forward to two weeks ago when I told you about how Warner Brothers finally said fuck it and gave up playing Chicken vs. Disney Marvel and Black Widow and decided to just dump Wonder Woman 1984 as a Christmas day and date simultaneous theatrical streaming release on HBO Max, and explained how a lot of this move was much less about the quality of the movie, the reviews for which are actually pretty good so far, or the prospects for theater business returning, which nobody can be sure of now that we've got both a timeline for vaccinations and the government economy about to be in the hands of competent people again, than it was about Warner Brothers' parent company AT and being unhappy with the anemic sign-up numbers for the HBO Max service, which they view as a major, if not the main, content distribution focus of all their content-generating subsidiaries, and a key part of their strategy for competing as a global multimedia superpower in the coming 5G wars, not only against Disney, Google, Amazon, and Netflix, but also potential expansion by Chinese giants like Tencent and Alibaba. In any case, people were waiting for the other shoe to drop after Wonder Woman, and it turned out to be just 
all the shoes, with Warner Brothers announcing over the weekend that they decided to take their entire known 2021 slate, i.e. all the stuff that was finished and either pushed ahead from 2020 or slated for the early part of the year already, and pre-schedule it to release day and date for dual theatrical and HBO Max streaming release, an unprecedented first for a major studio. And they do mean all of it, from big-scale blockbusters like Kong vs. Godzilla, The Suicide Squad, Matrix 4, and Dune, to genre fare like the next Conjuring movie and prestige fare like The Many Saints of Newark, with reaction from the industry being, yeah, let's say mixed. We're gonna die! Okay, actually, not so much mixed. Basically, everyone in the industry but the people at AT&T and Warner Brothers upper management who signed off on the decision, who've had anything to say in public about this, are angry as hell about it. Other studios don't like it because they see it as a form of self-dealing. Because it's a form of self-dealing, theater companies are apoplectic because, obviously, it means that when these films come out, they'll sell that many fewer tickets. That's just kind of guaranteed. A lot of people in the entertainment press are mad about it because just having gone through most of one year where 95% of the releases have been streaming and studios have been able to use greater control over access to such to play favorites about who gets to see what and when for reviews and talent access are not looking forward to this becoming the norm any further going forward, and serious film lovers in general are looking at all these aspects combined as just being a massive all-around downside for the further degradation of the medium. More theater chains closing, more independent theaters strapped for content, more consolidation of power and control in the hands of a few corporations if things do somehow survive, a further fragmentation of the audience into niche home markets outside of a handful of homogenous blockbusters, you know, the artificial sense of more options papering over the diminishment of actual choices. And, you know, that's pretty much where I am, folks. It's very difficult to see how this doesn't just serve to push everything in the direction of exactly that and that's bad. So yeah, I'm more or less on the side of this that looks at that and goes, this is bad, they shouldn't have done it. Which, as it turns out, puts me unsurprisingly but a little awkwardly, which we'll circle back to, at least in the initial perception on the nominal same side as, well, Christopher Nolan, who has blasted this decision as a betrayal of the cinematic medium by the studio he's called home for decades, and even told The Hollywood Reporter, and I quote, some of our industry's biggest filmmakers and most important movie stars went to bed the night before thinking they were working for the greatest movie studio and woke up to find out they were working for the worst streaming service. Which is harsh, but for a change, Mr. Inception is not simply throwing around big swing and dick buzzwords. For years now, Warner Brothers has cultivated a specific company identity within the industry as being an artist-friendly, filmmaker-focused brand among the major studios. Still a business, yeah, and still cranking out tentpoles based on licensed IP and big-name stars like everyone else, but with an office culture more receptive to the auteur mindset, the idea of the singular creative voice less married to the idea of the network TV-style collaboration machine operation operating over at, say, Disney. A studio that'll roll the dice on, say, an R-rated militant feminist power fantasy Batman fanfiction, R-rated incel power fantasy Batman fanfiction, nearly R-rated objectivist Batman fanfiction, whatever the hell Christopher Nolan wants to do whenever he wants to do it, 165 million for Denis Villeneuve to be the latest guy to try their luck at Dune, aka Warner Brothers is just never gonna see that money again. All, all sarcasm aside, you know, they also have Eva DuVernay still set up to do New Gods. They were the bold studio that filmmakers who cared about their work as more than just the latest installment in the episodic product line could count on to back them up about that. And in Nolan's view, this represents a break from that. And whatever you think about his tendency to be pretentious about stuff, because he's pretentious about stuff, he's not alone on this one, and it's not just about fluffy, esoteric, highfalutin, artsy idealism. It's also about the business side, aka fucking around with people's money. Movies have multiple producers, investors, and production companies, i.e. groups of investors and investment firms incorporated collectively, that's what all the logos before the credits are about, involved in the funding and distribution of the end product. That's not necessarily counting the various back and front end deals secured with actors, directors, writers, etc. who serve as producers themselves in order to get this or that property to screen. How how much each individual entity stands to actually make is generally pre-negotiated based on different tiers of release, theatrical, domestic, international, home video, broadcast, streaming, all separate, and all generally based on conventional calculus of which is getting a priority. With that upended, a lot of people's contracts potentially suddenly kind of suck depending on which points you took on what. And unlike Wonder Woman 1984, where Warner execs reportedly made sure to individually negotiate special deals to make sure talent like Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins still got nice, comfy, please continue to work with us on future sequels and other projects landings when the big changeover was made, this whole okay now everything else decision caught everyone involved in the actual movies off guard. Nobody knew what was happening, was given any say or input on the matter, nothing. Not even the other properties where Warner Brothers was only distributing a production that another studio produced and did most of the work on via cost sharing arrangement, as was the case with Legendary Pictures on Kong vs. Godzilla and Dune. And sure enough, as of my writing this script for Monday night, Legendary's reply to Warner Brothers has been, we think we're getting screwed on that, we'll see you in court. And frankly, I hope they follow through on this, and I hope they can 
kick the shit out of him over it. And not only because I think it's kind of symbolically bullshit that this same studio months ago was telling everyone they should risk it all, or when things were much more immediately perilous over Nolan's mumbly dialogue backwards spy movie, but now when it comes to a property that's literally designed to be ideally seen in large scale possible, because, you know, the two stars of the film are the size of fucking buildings, now they're okay dumping it onto streaming? Screw that. But also because, yeah, from where I'm standing, it really does look more like the assessment that this is the parent company telling one subsidiary to bleed itself out in order to boost up another part of the machinery, and using the pandemic as cover for doing it all at once instead of taking it case by case, when the fact is, we don't know what the situation is going to look like six, four, or even just two months from now, or maybe less. And if you want to say I'm a hypocrite because I'm agreeing with Christopher Nolan's position now when I was so very against it before and still think he was being a pretentious douche before, well, I mean, you're probably going to do that no matter what I say, but go right ahead. Regardless, you'd be wrong. His position was always about artistic integrity with little to no concern for the situational risk. He wanted theaters open and people seeing Tenet back in the middle of some of the worst, most uncertain months of the plague during the most chaotic months of the Trump administration's criminal rampage through the U.S. government at the point when it still seemed plausible that said rampage, and thus the pandemic that it both unleashed and exacerbated through sheer malicious negligence, could be extended for who knows how many years. That was a dangerous and irresponsible prospect. But now, in my opinion, as it stands right now, we're in a different place, potentially a much different place, and it's becoming more of a different place by the day. We have incoming vaccines from multiple sources. We're about to have an entirely different government in the U.S., which in some respects is an even greater factor. There's no telling how much worse the pandemic was made by our system's pre-existing Trump infection, so it's entirely possible that intelligence returning to the management of American government and a veneer of sanity and civilization returning to American daily life, you know, at least parts of this country, you could see the virus controlled and people able to live again sooner than people imagine. And that could indeed mean more regular release windows for theatrical movie schedules again, maybe not for everything on the Warner Brothers slate, certainly, but for some of it. Except now, nothing will even get the chance. Not the movies, not the people who made them, not the movie theaters. The owners of which are now basically left hoping against hope that when its big investor call hits on Thursday, the Disney company sticks to its guns, i.e. Black Widow, staying exclusive to theaters since we've already got plenty of stuff to stream on Plus. But even then, that would just mean they're further into a situation where one studio holds all the cards and gets to make all the rules about what's going to be in theaters and when. That's not good either. And look, maybe you don't care. Maybe you disagree with me completely, and of course it should go without saying that all of this is still very small potatoes next to the fact that there is still a plague, and what's really important is getting the vaccines out, getting people well, etc. But as far as this whole business goes, that's where things stand, and, you know, that's my opinion on it. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. So this entire time, the entire time that all of this has been going on, from about the collapse of Justice League into present tense of these videos, the one big thing, the one big, maybe this isn't a total fucking loss factor for the original DCEU, has been that everyone more or less agreed that Wonder Woman was a legitimately good movie and the whole team was coming back for a second one that almost had to be good, if not better. Warner Brothers was hanging just about everything on this one. They trailered it for like two and a half years. The trailers had looked really solid. Everything was looking up. It was just assumed that no matter what, this was the saving grace. No matter what happened, this was going to land. Everyone was going to get reminded that whatever else was going on, this was a real studio with a real brand still making A-list movies in the genre, and it had a leg to stand on, goddammit. And then, in December of 2020, Wonder Woman 1984 was released, and for many reasons, it was not to be a Merry Christmas for Warner Brothers. By now, everybody knows Wonder Woman 1984 got delayed about a dozen times over the last year and a half because nobody could get a handle on whether or not it was going to be viable to release any movies in theaters during the COVID pandemic and now is getting a release direct to HBO Max as the launch case for Warner Brothers' recent decision to dump the entire 2021 slate direct to day and date streaming, a decision they might have been regretting before and are perhaps now even more so since it turns out this was maybe not the one to answer the question of what does it look like when everyone who's been lonely and pissed off for nine months in a plague can pause and live tweet a big dumb blockbuster on opening night instead of having to sit 
sit in the dark theater, surrounded by human emotional connectivity, having their collective senses overwhelmed by expensive, colorful stimuli. But perhaps it has something to do with the part everyone forgets, that prior to getting delayed because of the pandemic, this shot in 2018 movie already delayed several times before that, both officially and unofficially, with stories of negative test screenings, internal battles over the screenplay, and a couple of big reshoots all circulating for the past couple years amid the general, broader, slow-motion train wreck of Warner Brothers continuing to attempt to somehow unfuck the now four years old last time they bet the future of the studio on an unproven plan launched with a DC movie and set in motion before getting the actual results of the first part back. Other than that, it's, you know, actually not really that bad. Yeah, as you might have heard, this one's kind of a mess. It's kind of hard to say exactly how much of a mess it actually is, because it managed to land in such a way that it's hard to extricate the messiness of the film, which, while it really can't be said to work in the conventional sense, you might offer that the film approaches the concepts of narrative and tone the same way Gal Gadot approaches English language pronunciation. Interestingly, often compellingly, and certainly unique, yet with the listener left to think, that's not where any of that emphasis is supposed to go. It's also making some fairly admirable big leaps and trying hard to expand the visual, tonal, and even thematic vocabulary of its genre and deserves no small amount of praise for that effort, even if ultimately it doesn't coalesce at all. And whether that lack of cohesion is baked into the calculations of doing a feature that according to its director was deliberately aiming to hit the kind of hyper-earnest notes generally regarded as cheesy or campy in current parlance, or if a stronger central presence would have made the difference, or if, as appears to be at least partly the case regardless, the narrative structure itself has been both initially constrained and subsequently mangled further by the ever-changing plans of future adjacent franchise projects to come in the continuingly troubled DC Extended Universe, the answers to which are unknowable and immaterial at this point, the fact is we're left with, regardless, a truly bizarre film that in its fleeting best moments is colorful, exciting, and whimsical, but for the most part stays stuck somewhere between being too boring to be as bizarre as it is, too complicated to be as simplistic as it is, much too silly to play with the kind of ideas it eventually wants to consider, and constantly trying too hard to convince the audience audience that we are also having a good time. Too often it's the movie equivalent of hanging out with a friend who's a couple drinks ahead of you, already dancing to music only it can hear and laughing too hard at its own jokes. But as I said, credit where it's due, I can't think of many films recently that have successfully managed to get a major studio to drop 200 million on a storyline entirely built around the words magic wishing rock, but that's what they've done. And at least in theory, it's the kind of Silver Age comic book nonsense that DC characters generally perform best in. This is the kind of story where Wonder Woman probably belongs in theory. And they're working with a novel twist on that concept, the main story taking place as established by the title in 1984 with the immortal Wonder Woman aka Diana Prince doing her superheroics in secret in the sense that it was hard to take candid photos back then, a retcon from previous appearances, but really who cares, revolves around an ancient crystal MacGuffin that literally grants the wish of anyone who touches it and wishes for real, that's what we're going with. But of course, it's actually cursed and running on monkey's paw rules, i.e. every wish comes with darkly ironic strings attached in the form of the wisher, losing some other important aspect of themselves or their broader life, possession, whatever. The aforementioned novel twist is that our nominal villain, Pedro Pascal's Max Lord, already knows that this is the trick kind of wish-granting totem and has tried to hack the curse. He wishes to claim the rock's powers and thus power over the curse part for himself, becoming not only able to grant wishes, but to decide what he gets to take as payment from those he grants them to. I think the film is eventually a little hazy on how much control he has over that, theoretically giving himself both absolute power and a way to continuously refill anything his wish may take from him, so long as he keeps finding people with wants to say yes to and zero regard for their effect on the world around them, which of course escalates until he's unleashed global chaos and pushed the US and Soviet Union to the brink of weapons hot nuclear war, and no you're not imagining that this is also the B story from Bruce Almighty. Anyway, only Wonder Woman can stop him because it's the 80s, Superman is probably still a teenager and they haven't picked a new actor to play him anyway, but this is complicated by her having already made a wish of her own that has inadvertently returned Chris Pine's Steve Trevor to life, kind of, it's also a little vague on that point, which it really shouldn't be, since they're hanging their main character's entire character on this point, but he's basically possessing some other random guy's body and only she can see it, or maybe not. Either way, it raises very troubling ethical questions that the film has no interest in grappling with, or more likely, looks like it may have been, but was made not to at some point in the two years this thing has been ping-ponging around in post-production. Also on hand is Kristen Wiig doing a lot of heavy lifting to have fun with an underwritten secondary villain role as a version of Cheetah, who wished to be like Diana but also turned evil, 
basically because she finds it kind of insufferable that her model gorgeous friend who looks just like Gal Gadot is always complaining about how difficult and lonely her life is, which when you say it out loud like that actually is kind of hard to argue in context, and then turns into a cat monster because, I'm not kidding about this, she was really, really into a pair of leopard print heels that Diana was wearing one time. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. Okay. And if you're noticing that I'm not talking about Wonder Woman much in this Wonder Woman sequel review, well, that's kind of where I feel like the actual central issue lies. There's a lot that's off, awkward, silly, wrong, nonsensical about this particular film, but not necessarily anything that couldn't have been at least mitigated to the point of general acceptability by a strong lead presence. Despite some ill-advised, faltering feints toward big idea socio-political depth in its third act, Wonder Woman 1984 mainly seems to want to be something between a bouncy action fantasy romp and a rom-com mood piece, something more invested in carrying off the idea of an action sequel a bad guy speech, romantic interlude, whatever, than the actual substance of those things, and you can coast a whole one of these movies on exactly that. Aquaman pulled it off a resoundingly short time ago while being significantly more ridiculous than this still extremely silly movie ever gets, the difference being it turned out Jason Momoa was up to the task of filling up an otherwise somewhat weightless feature with all of his spare personality and star power. Wonder Woman 1984 makes this same ask of Gal Gadot, and unfortunately not so much. That's not to say she's bad in this one or that she's not making a game effort, but not every actor, and even then not every time, can project themselves big enough to make up for a rest of the whole movie, and so far that doesn't appear to be her. She's still got tons of charisma and screen presence, still looks believable in the action scenes when the effects aren't letting her down, which is often, and like a million bucks just, you know, standing around otherwise, but the script gives her nothing to work with, and she's at least not yet an actor who turned to for spinning something out of nothing. Diana has no fresh arc or characterization this time outside of Mrs. Steve, is happy to see Steve, becomes pensive about possibly losing Steve again, and since you can see where that's going a mile away because it means we're literally just repeating her arc from the last time in truncated form because nobody knows what DC Universe franchise is going, and thus her character can't actually advance in this. So while a recurring protagonist doesn't necessarily need to grow each time, they do need to do something, and that's without even touching on how a studio that supposedly so closely protects the iconographic value of its IP characters like this decide that the Amazon feminist warrior princess superheroine should have her entire cycle psychological background, emotional center, raison d'etre, main moral conflict, everything just boil down to Chris Pine's penis. I mean, I'm joking around here, but I'm also not. In the absence of a place to go in her own sequel's plot that might leave the second of only two Justice Leaguers who didn't sense bail, get recast, sue the studio, or choke someone in a bar, in a slightly less malleable place for whatever they want to do next, and clearly recognizing the need for a sidekick to pick up the whole displaying more than one emotion or expression at a time slack, they've made everything in Diana's still kind of thin characterization revolve so much around this one guy she knew for like a month 60 years ago, she might as well just wear a picture of his face as her superhero insignia. And while I'm not necessarily suggesting that that being transcendently romantically committed to a man across all of time is a diminishing characterization for a supposedly uber-progressive action heroine, the way it's presented here makes her come off like a sad, obsessed weirdo, exacerbated by the movie itself not seeming to get this and instead acting like there's some kind of extremely relatable, tragic, romantic thing happening here. Now, on the upside, it's colorful, it's trying very hard to do something different in terms of how these things usually resolve, and there's some very over-the-top action beats, and, you know, paradoxically, some of the most egregious, well, that was certainly a choice, flat-out offensively bad moments on hand are so what they are, it's kind of entertaining in that respect, so there's also that going on. Uh, yeah, overall though, gotta say that this one's a 4 out of 10, I think that's probably being generous just for the effort, but uh, yeah, 4 out of 10, and now we begin the waiting game on who from the production is going to break first and start revealing what actually happened here. So what the f happened here? A magic ticket my ass, McBain. I can't bring people back from the dead. We're just the people this mind switcher was made for by us. Wait a minute, Xena can't fly. I told you, I'm not Xena. I'm Lucy Lawless. Look at me, I'm a kitty. Meow. Rhetorically and quality-wise, I mean, since, you know, the thanks to the pandemic and the weird release and this being the end of goddamn December, this is still likely to be the top Hollywood box office movie, and as far as the studio who already preemptively got told by their bosses to cut losses and dump their entire 12 months of product to streaming no matter what happens is concerned, not failing is probably the same as succeeding, and they greenlit a part 3 before the tomatoes had even hit the footlight, so this is still part of the somewhat technically kind of working side of this decidedly lopsided mega franchise. But on like a fundamental house a movie level, Wonder Woman 1984 is basically a disaster, the plot doesn't make any 
any sense. The narrative conveying that is sloppy. The overall story both are trying to convey is exceptionally silly. The screenplay is just kind of bad. And the actors all seem stranded most of the time, unless they're engaged in action sequences where they defeat the villains and then lose to shockingly inconsistent special effects themselves. Worse still, even with the divided response, you can already tell that it's not that divided, with arguments over the film's merit generally breaking down to here's a rundown of everything that doesn't work versus yeah, that's all true, I just liked it anyway, and or I had fun with it as a cartoonishly bad action movie, please let me have this, I've been locked indoors during a plague for nine months. Thing is, I can't exactly disagree on the latter spirit. Functionally or not, it's clear from the get-go that making a big, colorful, intentionally campy and deliberately silly superhero movie actively drenched in retro Silver Age DC Comics cheesy sincerity was exactly what director Patty Jenkins was going for here in terms of overall narrative and aesthetic, and she got her way. The bad guys are over at the top, the hero fights for and with the power of friendship, love, and appealing to people's better angels, the entire $200 million action-heavy enterprise is hinged on the story device of a magic rock that grants wishes, and Wonder Woman can swing by her lasso from lightning bolts or just fly now because she believes in herself and someone told her that aerodynamics are a thing. And look, in theory, I'm 100% behind every bit of that. Good ideas, perfectly valid decisions, I support them all. Wonder Woman is, after all, a sexy golem from an island of immortal lesbian demigods who rides giant kangaroos, flies an invisible jet, and battles the forces of evil with light BDSM roleplay and sometimes also murder. And as is the case with the vast majority of this stuff, these are fundamentally colorful fantasy stories about powerful wish fulfillment figures intended for children. Silly is a completely appropriate place to take this property this material, this character, etc. Gordon Gecko finds Aladdin's lamp and reignites the Cold War with selfish wishes sounds exactly like a quintessential classic Wonder Woman comic book story from the era of history when people actually bought and read Wonder Woman comic books. But you still have to do a good job. I mean, I almost feel tacky invoking him because this isn't really specifically what he was talking about, but it reminds me of Fred Rogers' general point about how so much of kids' entertainment was low effort because the people making it figured it's for kids, it's silly, it doesn't have to be good. Yeah, it does. And the same thing applies to going for big silly, even kind of dumb superhero spectacle. You don't just get to say our central plot device is a wishing rock and Kristen Wiig is going to turn into a werecat, this doesn't need to make sense or be good. It does still need to be good, and conversely, the movie isn't bad because it's campy. It's bad because it's campy while also being lazy, boring, and incoherent about it. Paradoxically, the story is so weird and told so badly, it's hard to stay invested enough to follow any of it. You can't care because the movie itself doesn't seem to care. And since this kind of seems like it's going to be the consensus, as I said, so far even a lot of the folks who really like this one seem ready to concede up front that it's a big dumb mess of a thing, and that just did it for them, that means the more interesting question amid the fallout is going to be how and why it managed to land at this point. Because remember, it's not like they rushed this. They started up on this not long after the first one hit in 2017 and shot most of it in 2018 with the aim of getting it into theaters first for December and then November of 2019. And it was widely reported, though obviously never with official confirmation, that pretty far along cuts were already test screening as early as June and then again in October of that year. And the reaction wasn't pretty early on, allegedly, though it's unclear whether or not that was behind any of the film's initial publicly known to have occurred reshoots. And then the release was delayed even longer by an entire year eventually by the COVID outbreak. That's a lot of time, space, and opportunity for a studio, a filmmaker, actors who have producer credits, investors, to say nothing of parent companies who can override all of them, to have second thoughts, get into the kitchen, and decide that the sauce needs more bay leaves or whatever cooking metaphor you prefer to use here. I mean, it's not like there isn't a huge precedent for things like that to happen on Warner Brothers DC movies. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that this has to be the case, or that I've uncovered some kind of special insight that makes it more likely than the Occam's Razor plus optimism scenario, i.e. everyone, including Patty Jenkins, went into this with the best of intentions, tried their best on a very different kind of blockbuster experience, and it just didn't work out, and that's too bad. That remains completely plausible and a reasonable explanation. But having seen it, and thought it over, and looked back into the production history and reporting, yeah, I do think it looks equally possible that no, either the whole thing or a bunch of individual things in it were supposed to be very different at one point, and somewhere along the line, people started changing their minds, and eventually too many bricks got pulled out of the foundation and the structure collapsed. I mean, this does happen. Terminator Salvation decided to throw out its entire third act that they'd already built sets and effects for because the ending leaked online and people decided they hated it, and it ended up changing the ending, the characters, and the entire plot of the film into incomprehensible nonsense as they tried to course correct in the middle of filming that movie. 
look it up. This is true. Now, since this is a brand new film, my plan is to do a second separate video with spoiler warnings about the plot specific stuff in here that made me think, oh yeah, something got changed or cut out here in a day or two. It kind of has to get segregated off like that because other than the big obvious rumors that didn't pan out, like no, there aren't Justice League cameos because they haven't cast the new Batman or Superman yet anyway, and no, the Wishing Rock isn't a setup for Sandman, which is still in production, but as a Netflix thing, so it's not entirely clear if Warner Brothers wants to acknowledge it when since they're trying to make the HBO Max thing happen for themselves. Otherwise, any of the standout bits are, you know, spoilers, so look ahead for that. What I can say broadly in terms of conjecture and deduction for now is that if things did get chopped up and moved around here, it was probably an ongoing piecemeal process and not an all-at-once overhaul, hence why the whole thing feels clunky and disjointed. The entire time this has been in production, the rest of the ever-changed project to right the ship at Warner in DC has been playing out in the background. They've scrapped whole projects, changed direction, recast roles, changed their minds about whether or not to reset their main continuity, and if so, when, where, and how to do that, and now, according to DC Films President Walter Hamada in the most recent New York Times, they're looking to split their releases into some theatrical movies and some streaming spin-offs, while also maintaining separate running continuities for some of the more popular characters, including, for example, at least two different series of live-action Batman films running at the same time, so the Robert Pattinson version doesn't have to worry about interacting with the other stuff because they haven't figured the other stuff out yet, with Hamada additionally confirming that the eventual Flash movie will be a Flashpoint thing, worst kept secret in the industry at this point, meant to explain the DC multiverse for mainstream audiences so that multiple running continuities from multiple versions of the most popular characters can be constantly running in sync. I gotta tell you, that, that, that sounds awful. Now what does that mean otherwise about the future of all this stuff? Well, clearly, no one can say because there still doesn't seem to be a clear, coherent plan, or even a vision or general idea for any of this that can't be thrown out and changed on a whim to the complete detriment of any one individual film or several down the line or even an entire otherwise unrelated studio slate. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Making a rigid plan before you know if anyone wants what you're planning to make is how you end up with a disaster like the Dark Universe over at Universal, and while everyone touts the Marvel model, the real secret to Marvel Studios' success is that the whole continuity consistency thing has never actually been either as deeply connected, important to the overall story of the individual films, or taken as seriously as you think. Odin's treasures. Fake. It just feels like it does after the fact, because they make the payoffs actually count for something, and you feel like you earned something and were in on a special little secret. In other words, the problem here isn't that the studio still clearly making up the DC universe as it goes along. That's actually fine. You can make these things up on the fly. All the stuff it was based on was made up on the fly in the first place. The problem is they don't seem to actually care about what's getting made up, no matter how much work is going into it. I'm Bob, and at least for now, that's the big picture. So what the f*** happened here? SPOILER VERSION! Okay, let's get right into it. The weirdest, most nonsensical thing in Wonder Woman 1984 is Steve Trevor coming back to life. Not necessarily that he does come back to life, it's a superhero movie, there's magical shit. He can do that here. It's not even that weird that they'd want the character to come back. Chris Pine is a good presence, he's good in this part, and yeah, whenever this gets to the parts where Diana is alone and has to do all of her own exposition or carry the entire dramatic weight of a scene, you immediately understand why they thought they needed to get the co-star from the first one back for a bunch of this one as well. Sidebar, yes, that does mean I'm saying Gal Gadot is at this point still a very limited actress and not particularly capable of carrying a fully rounded solo lead and that this is a problem with the franchise, but I also feel like a lot of people who've pointed this out have unfairly singled her out in that respect when this is a problem across a lot of these properties. I mean, Henry Cavill isn't exactly Gary Oldman. Honestly, Henry Cavill isn't exactly Gary Daniels even. He and Godot mostly appear to have been cast on their ability to look iconic as their characters and capably deliver dialogue and declarative sentences while posing dramatically in their costumes because the first of these were Zack Snyder productions and that's how he approaches this genre to, let's say, mixed results. Either way, it didn't work out for her here. But anyway, the actual issue in 1984 is that the manner in which he's back is incredibly confusing and overly complicated in ways that make the story hard to follow and actively worse, but most egregiously, apparently do so to no actual discernible purpose, as in there doesn't seem to be a reason for any of the things that make this not make sense to be part of the story to begin with. Here's the thing. The main thrust of him coming back is that it happens because Diana accidentally wishes for it using the magic wishing rock that's the big central MacGuffin of the story, not knowing at the time that this is what the rock does, and also not knowing that the wish comes with a curse whereby the wisher loses a precious aspect of themselves 
themselves in exchange for what they asked for. In her case, this means losing her superpowers, or at least a portion of them. She can still do everything, just less well, like bullets hurt her now and she can lose a fistfight with Cheetah later. So obviously her big moral arc is going to be a repeat of the end of the first movie, since you can get whatever you lost back by renouncing her wish, she needs to let Steve go again in order to have the power necessary to stop the bad guys. Which, okay, that's a storyline, fine, it tracks. The bigger issue is that Steve doesn't just come back to life. There's a whole mechanism employed to get him back, whereby his spirit and consciousness, identity, whatever, is inhabiting another random guy's body, and apparently, while Diana can see him as Steve, and eventually we do so as well, and Chris Pine can be back in the movie doing goofy Back to the Future man confused by ordinary contemporary things shtick, we're meant to understand that they're both essentially just taking this entire other guy for a literal and figurative and double entendre ride, and apart from only being one of several reasons for, again, literally, Diana to get out of bed and go figure out what's going on, this never becomes important. Like, they never talk about whether or not this is right, whether either of them feel in any way morally questionable about effectively brain kidnapping and sexually assaulting a guy, they don't really seem bothered by it, and it also doesn't affect the story at all, as in being this guy instead of himself or some other guy doesn't have any positive or negative effect on what Steve is able to do or not do in the plot, where he's able to go, it doesn't end up coming in handy or getting in the way, there's no grim monkey's paw irony to the wishing rock choosing to hijack this guy, it's just a whole other detail that changes nothing for the eventual payoff of he has to go away again for her to get her powers back, lesson learned about trying to wish away your problems without considering the consequences, I guess. Other than adding a whole other layer that kind of makes your two main characters complicit in a major consent violation and then never dealing with this. So, what happened here? What did you do? Because something probably happened here. You can tell because, stupidly easy trade secret incoming folks, everything in a movie costs money. Every word, every detail of a script, every actor you hire, every piece of costuming, every time you turn the camera on, all of it. So the fact that this whole part of the story was written, performed, they hired an actor to play the other guy, maybe more than once, but we'll come back to that, his apartment and wardrobe or a whole set, they don't give him a name, but they give him a job title as an engineer of some kind, it never comes up, but it's dialogue in the film, basically for something that's pretty widely noticed as a quote-unquote problematic thing, in the movie because it's treated as unimportant and it looks and feels a lot like this was supposed to be important at one point. And then somewhere in the nearly two year period when they shot this movie and when it finally came out, maybe someone decided it shouldn't be anymore and they had to cut around it in lieu of cutting it out. That's what looks like it happened, so what was it? that they cut out, I mean. And I'm asking because I don't know, and it's still just what I feel is a really likely guess that it was anything at all, so if I had to guess further, I'd say the other guy was supposed to matter at some point, and in fact the question of whether or not it was right to keep his situation going was at one point supposed to be the big moral conflict, not whether or not she loses her powers. The evidence for that being that all the scenes mentioning power loss are confined to bits that could easily have been inserts or ADR dialogue. The power restored scene that we get is accomplished by a really cheesy dissolve effect on a scene where she's running that looks added on instead of having been part of that scene before, and otherwise her powers and strength are as inconsistent as they've been in every movie she's been in, since this isn't the first scene of Dragon Ball Z, and nobody gives a shit about power levels here. She's always just exactly as strong or vulnerable as serves the dramatic choreography of the scene. But if so, why change it? I mean, I don't know, maybe acknowledging the whole body hijacking thing as a moral question in the first place made people uncomfortable in test screenings, and even if the good guys eventually realized it was bad, they decided to just not bring it up at all and hope no one would notice, which clearly didn't work. Maybe the guy himself was supposed to be a bigger character earlier in the movie, and they also have been a victim of the wishing rock, like maybe he was a co-worker of Diana's who wished for, well, this, and the ironic gotcha part he gets is that he gets it, but also doesn't, which I feel like that's definitely not better, at least. But another possibility? Maybe less likely, but also maybe not, this was at one point supposed to be a backdoor introduction for another DC movie character. You know, with kind of an, oh, nice to meet you, Diana, I'm so-and-so, hey, have we met somewhere? When he shows up again at the very end. But then, since the plans for all that have fallen apart and fallen apart again so many times while they were making and delaying this, it became no longer the plan and they had to cut it out and maybe even recast and reshoot the parts with the real guy. Hell, given the whole magic thing, it could even have been resolved in a way to retroactively pop Chris Pine into a new role entirely on those same lines. You may recall there was a flurry of rumor that he was actually, or really, or also, playing Hal Jordan the Green Lantern back when the first movie, Batman v Superman and Justice League, were all in semi-simultaneous casting and pre-production. That's a whole other thing, though. Now, I mostly bring this up because most of the other doesn't-make-any-sense stuff that has the same problem of not only being nonsensical or problematic in at least one case, but also nonsensical or problematic in ways that would be easily fixed by just streamlining, cutting them out as unnecessary, after a simple ask of why 
why is this in the movie in the first place? Almost in every case, it feels like one really probable explanation for why wouldn't you have just done that long before you shot this movie and way before you had to leave it in would be it was originally there to load the bases for the sequel or one of the other movies, but we aren't doing that anymore, so whatever it was referencing is now gone, so now it's just a detour that doesn't actually show off anything specific. To go with the problematic example first, all right, I'm just going to pull my chute right up front and say I don't think I've got the geopolitical expertise or standing to comment in any meaningful way on whether or not it's in poor taste to do an action scene involving missiles and imperiled Arab children when your lead actress was in the IDF, other than to say, yes, the moment did stick out to me, and I did think, well, that's certainly a choice, and some people will be talking about it more than Warner Brothers probably thinks they will, i.e. at all. That having been said, the fact that the good guys follow the bad guy to Egypt, stop to have one of the big set-piece action scenes there, but it's an open-road vehicle chase you could probably have staged anywhere, and then leave Egypt, and the only important narrative moment that's happened is Max Lord picking up a few more henchmen and the wish-induced exacerbating of a land dispute that we're informed later via news broadcast ADR is making the Cold War worse, i.e. another plot point that could have been accomplished without the expensive and time-consuming scenery change, especially since the nuclear standoff thing that actually incites Act 3 happens because the president, who's clearly meant to be an already Alzheimer's distracted Ronald Reagan, which is as close as the film actually gets to having any real edge about its period setting despite Pedro Pascal's Trump impression, wishes for a bunch of extra nukes because, as noted, he's not in his right mind, so there was no reason for the movie to go to Egypt at all, not even really for the plot point of Max Lord trying to grab more oil rights since there's already a whole other subplot before that about another DC character in the film, Simon Stagg, the bad guy from Metamorpho, who also gets a certain amount of, hey, look who it is, build up that never amounts to anything. Now, to be charitable, one could assume it's the James Bond excuse, i.e. they went to an exotic location to go to the exotic location. Except they don't use the location for much, it's just a car chase and a shootout in a mostly neutral desert road. But on the other hand, they make a big point of noting that the land the Amir played by Egyptian actor Amr Wakat is wishing back is Bialia, a fictional DC Comics Middle Eastern nation that gets used pretty much when they want to do Middle East stories but don't want to risk doing anything politically offensive. As you may expect, there are plenty of prominent DC characters whose backgrounds tie into Egypt who could have also been retroactively teased and tied back to this story point by placing the DCEU's movie version of on the border of Cairo, including Hawkman, Hawkgirl, and in the case more likely here than anything else, Black Adam, the Egyptian Shazam nemesis still set to be played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson whenever that schedule opens back up. Was that supposed to be the case here? Who knows? There's also some less overt stuff. The Kingdom Come Golden Eagle armor Diana busts out for the finale turns out to be a suit worn by a legendary Amazon named Artesia who stayed behind in Man's World to allow the others to escape back when that whole thing went down. We're informed that Diana has the armor because she went looking for the other Amazon but only ever found the armor on its own, and in a flashback when she tells the story we don't see this woman's face apart from a close-up of her eyes until a mid credit scene where the character appears still apparently very much alive after all and played by the original TV Wonder Woman Linda Carter. And hey, it's fun to see her. Good cameo, good get, etc. But again, the economy of stuff actually in the movie was the setup and the staging of the flashback and the scenes, plural, adding this additional business to the plot point of Diana has an in-case-of-emergency extra weapon really only there for this cameo? Did you have Linda Carter sign for a cameo the whole time? And rather than incorporating her meaningfully into the plot where she could have, say, interacted with the current Wonder Woman even for a scene you decide to add a bunch of extra beats and a mid-credits gag? I mean, that's possible, but it's also possible that this golden armor, long-lost other Amazon in Man's World plot point was meant to originally be another Amazon character from the comics, maybe one whose existence and actress would get revealed in a bonus scene and set up for another movie that they then decided not to do. Characters like Artemis or Nubia, for example. Speaking of which, Diana also name-checks a comics villain, the Duke of Deception, as the force behind the Wishing Rock, but he never actually turns up. Was he supposed to? It would have dovetailed nicely with the evil gods hiding in plain sight thing from the first movie. As I mentioned last time, apparently at one point there was a real intention for The Rock itself to serve as a setup for a hypothetical Sandman movie, and while that no longer appears to be anything like the case, the other characters do keep finding excuses to call it the Dreamstone a bunch of times. And also, doesn't it seem like they change their mind a bunch of times about how the Dreamstone is even supposed to work? Like, at first, it's clearly just doing the monkey's paw thing where you get the wish, but it actually sucks or screws you or someone else over somehow, but then Max Lord can just decide whatever you lose, but apparently it's supposed to also be the most precious thing to you. But then since when would that be powers for Wonder Woman? And come to think of it, we never find out how the deal with Max's son making an awkwardly worded wish on Max's behalf was supposed to work out? Is Max fading because the kid is supposed to lose him? That feels like an important thing not to spell out. The point is, before this gets any longer and more confusing than the actual movie was, it looks like there was more going on with what went wrong here than a series of well-intentioned but ultimately flawed decisions. And among the other things, it could have a lot to do with the ever-ongoing mess at Warner Brothers and DC Films still being a work in progress that's not actually getting any better as it progresses for anybody. And unfortunately, if that's the case, that's bad news for more than just the audience and the filmmakers related to this set of comic book adaptations. If the behind-the-scenes and after-the-fact bungling of this HBO Max slate rollout deal is any indication, all this mismanagement might be a systemic and spreading issue, and the implications of that are dire, given that this massive entertainment company is in charge of a huge part of the entertainment industry's most important past and present history. So even if we never find out how this went wrong and why, I hope someone is on top of it, because there might actually be quite a bit more at stake here, even if you don't give a shit about Wonder Woman sequels. <laughs> ¶¶